Hey guys, Scott here. Before we get started today, I just wanted to make a quick announcement. Uh, if you're listening to this on the Wednesday it came out, tomorrow is my co-host Matt's birthday. So uh, as you're listening to the podcast, make sure you guys wish Matt a very happy birthday. Uh, he doesn't know I'm doing this, so he's probably going to be mad at me, but I'm sorry, Matt. I just had to. Happy birthday. Hey everybody, welcome to We've Got Worm, a Daily Planet Films podcast series where we expertly dissect and discuss the hit web serial Worm week by week, arc by arc. In this reality, my name is Matt Freeman, mild-mannered host of this podcast, and I'm joined as always by Scott Daly, who I've just teleported into a burning building. Scott, how's it going? You know, Matt, I'm oddly calm considering this life or death situation that you've placed me in. Um, and yes, as you said, this is the podcast where you, a worm expert, guide me, a first time reader through Wild Bo's world of superheroes, supervillains and everything in between as I inspect, interpret and even speculate on what the story is and where it is going. You know, Matt, I just realized that we like threw a bunch of three beats into that, <laughs> that standard intro of ours. There's a ton of them in there. Um, the rule yeah. of three. It's a big it's a thing. Well, that's it's good you notice because the intro has lost all meaning as a sequence of English words to me <laughs> at this point. We've said it so many times. I don't think yeah. we actually know what it says anymore. That's very true. Mm -hmm. uh, this this week, we are tackling part two of Arc 16 Monarch. This covers chapters 16.7 through the end of the arc, which is 16.13 and one bonus interlude. Um, the second half of Arc 16, Matt, could probably be considered its own arc. Um, we move on mm -hmm. from the dragon centric storyline that, that w took up the first part of the arc. And here we witness the culmination of basically everything since arc seven or eight, um, mm -hmm. where we had this, this building tension between our protagonist and coil. Um, Matt, every complaint that I had about the first half of this arc, um, I have the opposite feeling <laughs> for, for the second half. Um, it, it, it's almost as if like, it's not even just just that this is good. It's that it's almost good in the exact ways that I didn't like the stuff in the first half. Um, motivations are always very clear. Stakes are very high. Um, the description around these really complicated things is just so fantastically well done. Um, this is it is a culmination and it's seeing our character um, take one huge step forward um, forward to a place that. Well, well, we'll get into that, but yeah. um, this is a really fantastic uh, arc or half arc for me. Yeah, F forward and and down, perhaps. Um, yeah, it, it's got several like consecutive, extremely propulsive, tense chapters um, that are among my favorite in the story. I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Let's uh, let's. Uh, but first, I just wanted to make a, a quick announcement before we get into the comments. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was a guest on the Bayesian Conspiracy podcast, where we talked about the ideas behind the book "Seeing Like a State" by James C. Scott. Uh, and that podcast should be released sometime in this coming week. So, if if you have any interest in in those sorts of ideas, which I suspect you might, if you're a worm reader, you're probably a somewhat intellectual person, then uh, maybe go go check out that podcast. Um, but uh, all right. And, and now let's get into the, the questions and comments. Yeah, Matt, was that is that like iTunes? Like, can you find it everywhere podcasts are at? Um, yeah, yeah. You'll, okay. you'll you won't have trouble finding Cause it because I personally am very interested to listen to this. So I'm cool. you told me about this a while ago and I've been looking forward to it. So it's finally ready this week. So, yeah, everyone else tune into that. I think that's going to be really interesting. Yeah. Well, thanks, Scott. OK, yeah. So uh, comments and questions. First, we wanted to clarify that. Um, Dr. Ed, edit what? Did we decide how to pronounce this name, Scott? I just call him Dr. Ed. <laughs> Dr. Ed. Dr. Ed was the one who introduced the Taylor's Toolbox terminology. Uh, last time we we couldn't remember who contributed that, and I just we just wanted to give credit for that because we use it all the time. Yeah, and it's like every episode, useful. including this one. That's right. Um, we also learned from French Fencer that literally all Americans pronounced coup de grâce wrong. Um, which I think means that English has assimilated that phrase and now it's actually just coup de gras and that's just how you say it. And yeah. I'm sorry. That sounds, I'm sorry. that sounds correct to me. So that's, I, I declare it in my authority as co-host of a podcast. This is how it's pronounced now. Yep. 
it's yeah. Uh, and uh, Dirtle in the YouTube comments uh, has a really good comment. Uh, I'm going to quote bits of it. Uh, basically, they, they point out that Taylor personifies all the problems of consequentialism along with all the good parts. Uh, so here's a quote. A, a real consequentialist is a doctor saying, well, the ends justify the means while vaccinating a crying child. A good narrative consequentialist is someone like Taylor saying it'll be worth it in the end while taking hostages. Um, and then later in the post, uh, yes, it's easy to use consequentialism as a prop for pure selfishness, but that's the case for all metaethical systems. Virtue ethicists are just trying to look good, uh, to look like good people. Deontologists are just trying to make things not their responsibility, etc. It's better uh, to mutually disarm such uncharitable arguments in metaethical debates. And um, I think that's all correct and, and quite wise, actually. Um, and and I, I don't, if I come across as like railing against consequentialism, I don't mean to um it's it's just it's an easy target in this particular story yeah absolutely and i like this comment a lot and whoever says that youtube doesn't have any good comments obviously has not seen ours because this That's is right this is really awesome um yeah and, and i agree with that i, I don't want to dive too far into a, an ethical moral argument again because uh we do that a lot and we're yeah. probably going to do it some on this episode as well but that's a very good comment and i think i think the, the problem with a lot of these systems is when you um take the system itself as bible and like there's no le like i think everything's on a spectrum and if you go too far one way then you're behaving inappropriately um no matter which that way is so i think that works with with consequentialism as well that makes sense yeah it makes sense to me all right, Scott, let's get into the beat by beat summary. Sure. And discussion. So 16.7 opens and uh, Taylor is is lying in bed, although we don't even realize that necessarily. Her, her first thoughts are of satisfaction about all the reconstruction work going on in her territory and some frustration that she might not be able to go talk to Coyle immediately. Um, and she's she's clearly inhabiting her bugs almost entirely, just kind of scanning through her territory and specifically looking for Charlotte and Sierra. Yeah. And if you um, are reading this thing as you go and not taking a week in between like we are, um, you remember that the last time we left Taylor, uh, she was in the middle of a a, a very intimate moment with uh, another human being and then we open up on here and it takes like 10 paragraphs uh before brian is even mentioned um and i like how you pointed out satisfaction and frustration here because you would think these feelings are tied to the thing she just did with brian um but they are not at all um she's mm -hmm. so far outside of herself in this moment that that she doesn't even notice that he's there yeah and and when he interrupts her her little escape she kind of remembers where she is and, and the, really the most she thinks about it is, is thinking that last night was nice. Yeah. Yeah. That sex we just had. I remember that now. That was a uh, neat. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's get on with it. Yeah. So, uh, Brian, Brian says that having her there helped him get through the night and she asks if he might benefit from seeing a psychiatrist. Uh, and he flinches at the thought of that. Um, he, he first responds, don't we all, uh, basically admitting that, yes, he does. But then he follows it up by saying that he has to figure it out for himself or it won't count and it won't really be a fix. Yeah, this is a uh, this is dumb. <laughs> Brian, <laughs> Brian is dumb here. Um, we, we talked last week about if we thought that Brian what like what we thought of the, the idea that Brian self admits that he's the type of person that would point out and attack weaknesses in others and how I, th I think neither of us really thought that he was that type of person. But what Brian is, is a person that is like terrified of admitting any weaknesses or showing any weaknesses, lest someone do that to him. Um, and it, trying to solve your own deep rooted psychological issues is a bad idea. Um, also a bad idea is having sex with someone else as a way of getting over your problems and requiring them to be there so you can just get through the night. These are bad ideas too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, he's, he, he's now imposing a large amount of emotional labor on, uh, on, on Skitter there. So yeah, it's, it's who, not a good... who very clearly, um, either does not feel the same way that he does or, um, is performing out of guilt more than. Um, an actual genuine connection or attraction to Brian at this point. Yeah. Poor, poor everyone. Um, so yeah, for some reason, this whole scene really makes the like inhumanity of having a power like this sink in. 
because she wakes up and she's instantly aware of, of a multi-block area to the extent that she forgets she's in bed with somebody. And then she gets in the shower, but she doesn't lose awareness of what Brian is doing for a single moment, even while she's showering. So, you know, she never gets a break from her power from this panopticon awareness. Yeah. And I think this, this helps in Taylor's removal from Taylor kind of because Mm -hmm. Skitter is not one person in one place anymore. Skitter is everywhere. Skitter is the swarm. Um, so we're kind of seeing here how much of Taylor just is that swarm and how much of her is no longer this human in this one body in this one place. Yeah, that's a really great point. That's 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 something actually that we might want to want your mark for paying attention to going forward. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, I I like this beat here that Brian has cultivated a habit of talking to empty rooms because he never knows if either Aisha or Taylor's uh, bug sense are are monitoring him or or, or present. Yeah, and it's like when you combine this with like that, we know the fact that he's hallucinating, that he's almost constantly reliving past events like he's never alone, Um, at least within his own mind. He's either back there in that freezer or he's assuming that someone he can't see is there with him. Like he's never alone. He's never without something. And he's not well. Like we keep getting, you know, indication after indication that Brian is not in a good place. Yeah, totally. Um, Although he manages to to paper it over really well. Uh, You know, for example, during this arc, when when there's stuff to do, he can kind of bury it and subsume it. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, over breakfast, uh, they just discuss movies and TV and books and, and their childhoods. Basically, they just kind of discuss the kind of things that you usually talk about on dates. Um, yeah, Scott, you wanted to point out this moment where she thinks Emma had turned on me, my mom had left me. Yeah, on top of it being like a weird order uh, for this kind of stuff, which I think Taylor herself points out in a couple paragraphs from now. But the fact that Taylor uses this phrase that my mom had left me, I think is really telling about how she feels about this whole thing because Taylor talks about her mom very rarely. Um, it, it, it it almost is never brought up by her. Um, it's someone else bringing it up and every single time it's followed by like an intense physical and emotional reaction. She's very clearly not over her death at all, but here we see her talk about her mom in the same beat as Emma, who did betray her, and as her father, who who in her mind failed her. Like her mom died in a car accident, but to Taylor, she left. She betrayed her. She failed her. She measures her mom's death at the same level of this betrayal by her former best friend and this failure by her father. And it's it's sad. It's like like it's just part of her trauma that she just can't get over this, and it, it just. It's depressing. Yeah, I mean, it, it's all it's all wrapped up together. Like the, the bullying thing, this is this is a part of that almost because right. the bullying was wrapped up in the fact that she withdrew after her mom's death. So she can't think about bullying without thinking about her mom to some degree. And she can't think about her mom without thinking about the bullying. And I think that's it's telling that she thinks those those thoughts in that sequence. She thinks about Emma and she thinks about her mom like right next to each other. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, she and Brian part ways with uh, Taylor ruminating on the lingering awkwardness and self-consciousness she feels. She really hasn't shown any true vulnerability to Brian. I don't think that her guards are still very much up. I think she's I still think she's too scared to lower them enough for true intimacy, uh, intimacy and, and I mean emotional intimacy, because there is a reason that relationships usually progress in what Taylor thinks of as a formulaic arc, uh, which is that you can't really have that vulnerability that that true intimacy without getting to know somebody first and not just as a supervillain. Yeah. Yeah. And I love how Taylor has the self-awareness to at least to acknowledge that they're doing everything backward, but I think it's more than just that they're doing it backward. I think they're doing it wrong. Um, and as you said, there's no emotional intimacy here. Um, there's no actual bonding over anything or any real, Uh, revealing of any vulnerabilities. It feels like they're just going through motions. And this kind of, when I was thinking about this and analyzing it, it kind of got me to think like, besides the fact that Brian looks good and Taylor is physically attracted to him, why does she like him? And I couldn't come up with an answer for this. I don't know if you can. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I I think, I mean, cynically, I think it probably is mostly the looks. I mean, it certainly was at first. Um, 
and uh, you know she she may like admire him as a leader in some ways and and like at a certain point it's like they've they've been through so much together you know i i, I guess i've learned uh that like people can develop feelings of attraction just by feeling excitement and being in proximity to each other um so it, it could yeah. be you know pretty much just just that yeah but i don't know if that's good i mean no, I, I like yeah I, I don't think that that is that can build a lasting relationship and it's like it to me it just goes into the end again we're seemingly getting confirmation that whatever this is it's not real it's not lasting and i don't see it going much further than it has mm -hmm. yeah okay well so yeah um she she leaves from she leaves from brian uh, and she goes to her dad's house uh, to hang out with him and apparently he's having a little shindig some of his friends came over kind of unannounced and they're really glad to see Taylor uh, with some of them commenting on how she's changed. Uh, Danny, at least in this setting, seems relaxed and happy to be surrounded by friends. Yeah, and I'm really glad we get to see Danny having a life here because most of the time we've seen him through Taylor's eyes and we've seen him as just father to to Taylor. Um, he's his life kind of revolves around her early on he was attempting to control her um, then it kind of moved into just him constantly worrying about her here we see danny the person he's having a beer he's chatting with friends he looks happy he looks good and i think that's important and i'm glad we get to see this side of him yeah it really does flesh him out there's this moment here where lacy says hey taylor haven't seen you since the funeral nearly two years after the fact it still hit me like a punch in the gut uh, so I, I mentioned that because you tweeted about this too, and and Taylor like physically flinches from this because it's like like you said it's a completely raw raw wound for her. Yeah, and I like I like what you said about how it's wrapped up in her trauma because we've talked over and over again about how in the life of a cape, their their trauma is constantly fresh and raw. Um, they're broken and they don't heal. They're just reliving this trauma over and over again. And uh, they have superpowers, which explains a lot of why the world is the way it is. Um, mm -hmm. The part that stood out for me the most about this, Matt, though, is th that after after Taylor has her reaction, she almost immediately looks at her dad to see what his reactions to this this news is. And um, she describes it as he lowered his head to stare at the can. Um, he didn't look devastated or even unhappy. It hadn't caught him off guard like it had me. And and I don't know if I'm reading too much into this, but this reads as a little bit judging here of her, her father. Um, it's clear to me, at least, that that her mother's death still does affect him. Like he breaks eye contact. He looks down. He focuses on an object so he doesn't have to look at people. Um, but he is further along in his acceptance of the loss, further along in his stages of grief than Taylor is. So, yes, he doesn't have a physical um, like flinching type of reaction. But it feels like she's almost saying, like, almost like, why not? Like, it's still fresh for me. Why isn't it for you? Yeah, I'm I'm trying to think whether I, I read that same implication into it. I mean, I, I think that this is definitely the space to mention that, like, he, he's an adult. And even though it was a huge loss for him, an adult just has more tools to deal with with loss. And she's, right. you know, at, at the time was, what, a 15-year-old girl and maybe even younger? I think I it's been two years, so I think she was yeah, so, 13 at the time. Yeah, she was potentially 13, and, and so um, really has no tools to deal with something of that magnitude. And I think, I think it's probably safe to say losing a parent is worse than losing a spouse. I don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe, I, sh yeah. maybe I shouldn't say something like that. That's probably insensitive. I, but I don't, um, Yeah, I mean, that's, I think everyone's going to uh, deal with their grief differently. But yeah. I, and, and I don't want to come off like we're blaming putting this all on taylor and like writing danny off scot-free i think he failed her he did like taylor feels that her father failed her and i think on some level she is correct um he in in his grief over suffering the loss of his wife failed to be the father to his daughter that she needed at the time uh, of suffering this grief and and so he has some culpability here and I'd, i i want to make sure that we're not we're not divorcing him of that. Like he, he was responsible on some level, but mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm not trying to say, to say that, that Danny's this perfect paragon of, of parenthood. But mm -hmm. um, I, I do, I do think that he serves a very important uh, point in, in this chapter and, and it's, it's how their two, their ideologies compare to each other. And I think this is kind of the first hint of it. Yeah. We'll, we'll see a little bit more of that in just a second. Um, yeah. So, so just to move on through the scene, 
it, it becomes clear that Danny's friends are indeed pre-partying in preparation for going to the mayoral debate, uh, which makes me wish I was cool enough to get drunk and go to political debates. See, this is one of those moments where I wish that we lived in the same place, because <laughs> I totally get drunk with you and go watch debates All any, right. anytime. Well, we got to make that happen, Scott. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the people at the party start, it's not really a party, but the, his friends uh, start railing at Mayor Christner. Uh, Kurt thinks that the mayor was wrong to argue against condemning the city, uh, to put it mildly. Apparently, the citizens would have received some money from the Inbringer Fund if the city had been shut down, which Taylor didn't know. Oh, you mean that things are a lot more complicated than they first appear and, and separating things into trolley problems to justify terrible actions might not be capturing the full story of things? <laughs> that maybe one person in this case a 15 year old girl isn't best suited to be making sole decisions for the well-being of thousands that just because you have the power to decide what's best for people doesn't necessarily mean you have the right to huh i guess i guess things are a little bit more complicated taylor i, I don't know scott it sounds to me like you're questioning taylor's authority <laughs> yeah so she 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 like and you get the sense this is a personality change for her but but here she can't shut up and back down when these people are apparently criticizing her choices yeah and she i mean like it's it's funny because the way it's written is not is like not the way i read it in my head like the way i read this in my head is it's just a hypothetical question but isn't it better to be in a city that works where villains rule the streets instead of a failed city with the same villains in a less prominent position like like do you do you agree that she's like kind of pissed off about this or is she you think she's keeping it keep, keeping a lid on it i refuse to believe that she could keep a lid on this i think <laughs> i think it's probably very confusing and suspicious for the people but i do agree that it's a total total character change for her um it shows how she's changed over this time and i love that these are adults and she's a child and she's sitting in a room full of adults and challenging the, them on this kind of stuff it yeah. it is it is very shocking and it it's like Taylor has been living in this high stakes world where she's had to make adult choices for so long that she doesn't even see herself as a child in an adult world anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then like in contrast, like we mentioned a minute ago, like when, as soon as Danny starts talking, um, like we realize that he's the, he is exactly the nuanced adult like thinker that Taylor would benefit from being around more. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and like someone who could who could you know shoot down her terrible ideas like so he he's saying uh, I'd rather not be a slave or in hell. My dad responded. But sometimes I worry I'm both. Maybe we don't get a choice. And then he goes on uh, in response to the comments about like basically the Taylor's Cape feudalism proposal. The problem with that is that we'd be setting humanity back about three thousand years if we let that happen. It'll be falling back into an Iron Age mindset and leadership. The people with the numbers and the weaponry lay claim to an area through sheer military strength. They stay in charge as long as they can through family lines, merging families with whoever else has the military strength. That lasts until the family in power peters out or something. someone smarter, stronger, or better armed comes in to seize control. That might, sound, uh, might not sound so bad until you figure that uh, sooner or later the person who gets control is going to be someone like Kaiser. Uh, Matt, <laughs> I'm so glad you got to read that whole quote because I love this so much. Um, this echoes some of the things that you and I have been pointing out for a few weeks now, um, that Taylor's plan has no long term portion of it, that that, yes, in the short term, Taylor and her friends stepping in is helping people. Um, that's great, but it's not sustainable. It is not secure. It is not safe. Um Danny, as this rational, fully formed adult, cuts to the core of this thing almost immediately. And in my opinion, at least, he's 100 percent right. And Matt, isn't he kind of channeling uh, what would Jean-Luc Picard do a little bit here? Yeah, I think a little bit. I mean, he's he's definitely thinking about it in a nuanced way. And, and I think, you know, one, one thing that's that's definitely true is he's not like immediately coming down on a side, um, which is something that our tailor is prone to do he, he's just kind of like well you know there, there's there's some complexity to it let me let, let, yeah. let's hash it out yeah maybe um, we don't need to turn everything into an either or problem maybe we can just talk about it uh yeah at, at a at a high level and see what we think yeah yeah totally my favorite line in this whole exchange though is i'd rather not be a slave or in hell but sometimes i worry i'm both and that mm. to me is just this like wonderful distillation of a lot of what worm has been talking about and 
I love that Taylor doesn't actually have a response to this. Um, we kind of the, the the party kind of moves on at this point, and Taylor doesn't get an opportunity or or isn't able to form an argument. Um, and, and she actually kind of accepts it and and acknowledges that like at some point she could get killed and someone's gonna could take over and be way worse than her. Um, and that could be growth, maybe, maybe. Yeah, as long as it's not one of these things where she's like, oh, I, I register this problem with my thinking. Now that I've registered it, that counts as solving it, and I'm going to move on. <laughs> I think we're going to see the greatest example of that here in a chapter. So. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, Taylor tells somebody that she's 15 in the party, and her dad corrects her that she's 16, uh, which means uh, that what happened last night was only a crime in about 25 states rather than all of them. Zing! Um, yeah, but she forgot her birthday due to the attack of the nine. Yeah, and I think this goes and reinforces um, what we were talking about earlier about how much of Taylor is just gone now. That she's been skitter for so long that the things that happened to Taylor aren't important to any- her anymore. Uh, yep. Birthdays, her her normal life, it just doesn't matter. Yep. Uh, Lacey does thank her for telling her dad that Shatterbird was in town um, and says that it probably saved them. And this this is such a really small little beat here, but I, I do think it's really important because and I think this is what kind of elevates Worm beyond just this simple morality tale, because we have this really complicated argument going on that's basically um, serving as this group of blue collar workers unknowingly like attacking everything that Skitter stands for. Um, and it has caused Taylor to doubt herself a little bit. And in the middle of this, we have Lacey come in and thank her for something genuinely heroic that she did, almost as if to say, yes, Taylor has engaged in some questionable questionable behavior. And yes, her ideas about government and leadership might be regressive and ultimately bad. But let's not forget that in between all this stuff, she has had her small moments of genuine heroism. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Um, I'm it's interesting because when you started when you started saying that, I, I thought the direction you were going is that it was going to like undermine the self criticality that she's in, in, imposing in this moment, and and she'd just be like, "Oh no, I I am a good person. I do save people." But that's not. It doesn't have to be that. I mean, it can just be like her allowing herself to feel okay a moment because yeah. she helped some people. I think it, I think it, it it's a cop out, but I think it can be both. Yeah. Um, I think she can use this to justify further action uh, on top of just reminding us the reader that hey like things are more complicated like you you can you can still feel like she's doing bad things while acknowledging that she has done some good yeah yeah no, I, I think we yeah it's like the hero versus monster dichotomy we've talked about uh so despite their inebriation they make their way to the town hall without working computers and tvs this is um, this is almost the only way people have of learning information about the candidates but even so, the debate is not well attended. It seems that half the people in the room are reported, uh, reporters. I guess that uh, Brocktonites have other priorities. Um, there's, there's this moment. Uh, I was caught between an ugly feeling of guilt and genuine curiosity in how the event would play out. Mostly guilt, but I couldn't do anything about that. I'd done what had to be done. Yeah, and <laughs> that's like, guilt doesn't do anything for you <laughs> if you don't let it. And that's like this moment is like, well, nothing I can do. guess I won't learn anything from this. Oh, well, I guess I'll just keep feeling bad about this. Yep. Yeah. So abruptly vans parked uh, outside disgorge a small army of mercs and coil arrives in an armored limo. Yeah. A pretty great cliffhanger here. Um, I think, I think like everyone else reading, um, we probably could have all guessed that something was going to go down at the debate, that we weren't just going to have this normal um, debate where we were just going to listen to people talk and then go home. Um, But still, this is a really, really dramatic shift in tone here. And it kind of gets you pumped up for what's happening next. And Matt, like overall, I really enjoyed this first chapter. Um, And like we said at at the top, I think it's better than just about anything we saw in the first half of the arc, except maybe that that one interlude. Um, and even more so, it feels it feels like an introductory chapter. Like we joked about how this feels like it's a whole new arc. And it's stuff like this that I think reinforces that, because this does feel like it's taking place in a whole new story arc on its own. 
Um, there's there's a lot of setup here specifically around the type of stuff we're going to be tackling throughout the rest of this half of the arc. So like you could almost just divide this out and call it its own arc. Yeah, I think so. I mean, she she touches base with her dad. She has a moment of quiet with Brian. Like it, it it sets everything up. It has all the earmarks of what we typically think of as a as an intro chapter to an arc. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I kind of frankly, you know, it doesn't so much matter how the arcs are, are named and numbered as you know how the narrative flows. And the narrative definitely kind of there's a there's a there's a pause here, and then it goes full steam from here. Yeah, it is interesting that i think a lot of i in the comments last week and and some of the emails we've gotten some people have said that they really do think that they could just divide arc 16 into two separate ones and like i think we have to remember that when you're reading this as a a, a fully published book like these these arc structural guidelines are arbitrary and don't matter um when you're reading it as it comes i could say I, you could see it like as exactly like it as a serialized story, it's an indication of a shift to a new type of storyline. It's that kind of stuff. But in book format, I don't know how much it matters. Um, like what would specifically be improved if you call this a different chapter or whatever in in book format. But it is interesting, at least. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to talk about. So, uh, yeah, like you said, that was the cliffhanger. And then we move into 16.8. Uh, the debate uh, starts up. Everyone in the hall is oblivious to what's happening outside. Uh, while in the lobby, Coil is joined by Circus and two other capes. Yeah, and this is really just textbook suspension gathering. Um, Coil is Hitchcock's bomb under the table that we know is going to go off, and we we keep playing with this too. I love the beat about um, where the the kid is crying, so like the father picks up his kid and like slowly walking down the hall, and Taylor's not sure what she should do, and then like they immediately get seized and grabbed and pulled off. And like you just you're just waiting for this bomb to go off. You know, it's going to happen. And it's so suspenseful. Yeah. Um, and, and this is another like moment of, of Taylor being involved in a, in a rough situation when she's in her like Taylor form. Um, so it's interesting to think about like how she's probably she's dealt with so much worse things that she's probably just like, all right, well, let me let me start solving this problem. She's not like freaked out by it, you know? Yeah. Um, so uh, Christner uh, on on the stage while this is happening is trying to talk up the state of the city, uh, talking about how things are improving. He name drops Chief Director Costa Brown and Dragon. I love this because unbeknownst to him, his evidence for how things are improving in the city involve a secret agent that's actually working for an unknown organization with very questionable morals, as well as a secret artificial intelligence who's currently working with a man who broke the only rule that capes actually regularly follow in this world. So it's like this he's name dropping these characters that we know as uh, questionable or at least uh, deceitful in in what's actually going on. It's this really funny beat of, of yeah. dramatic irony. Yeah, that is funny. And everyone else is just like, oh, yeah, those are two powerful, important people. Uh, yeah. So Grove points out uh, that uh, Brockton Bay was already bad before Leviathan. So he's the uh, make Brockton Bay great again candidate. That's that's right. I, I guess. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> then he mentions um, or the fact that anyone approaching within a mile and a half of the area is subjected to uncontrollable suicidal despair. I visited. I know. And of course, they're talking about the. The, the area out in the bay where, where they uh where they left cherish yeah and you feel bad kind of for cherish in this moment but also for everybody else um mm-hmm. i think this is a really good case study for the whole actions have consequences thing because we could sit here and argue all day about whether or not cherish deserved what happened to her but regardless of that the innocent people that have to walk through that or near it or are affected by it in any way certainly did not deserve it. So, yeah. I mean, these are, these are the kind of consequences of things that you can't anticipate. And yeah. yes, none of our characters did this. Um, it was not their fault, but like, this is, I think important for how sometimes we can't see the consequences of our actions when, uh, at the time. And I think we'll see that a little later, uh, in this, this arc. Mm hmm. So there's this delicious, delicious morsel right here where it's uh, Taylor's inner monologue. I tended to be more rational than emotional. If I was being totally honest with myself, though, my rationalizations were pretty heavily influenced by my feelings. I could come up with a rational justification for pretty much any course of action. It had led me this far, which wasn't necessarily a good thing. (laughs) 
<laughs> the first time I read this, I just cracked up laughing. It's yeah. so funny because the most amazing thing about Taylor is how self-aware she can be while simultaneously lacking any and all kinds of self-awareness um, because she has these thoughts, like you said, whenever she's not required to make some kind of decision. Um, but then as soon as she's required to make a choice, she shoves her self-awareness back into its compartment where it belongs. It's like, get back into that locker self-awareness and enjoy the tampons in there. And like, <laughs> she's like, that's what she does every time she has these realizations. She has the self-awareness come to her, but it never matters at the time of the actual choices that she has to make, it just disappears. Yeah, um, I mean, I think this is very, very human. Like th t to me, this this smacks of like the thought patterns of an of like an addict, where where you're, you know, you you justify um, pretty much any course of action that gets you the thing that you want, even while you're like, hey, I recognize that these impulses are, are you know not things that i approve of uh, i don't know yeah. does that does that an analogy make sense no it, it, i think it absolutely does and, and i think it's it shows that self-awareness by itself is only one part of the equation um mm -hmm. it, it doesn't matter if you know that you're doing something as long as you continue to do it mm -hmm. and and i yeah. think that's that's one of taylor's big problems is that she she is fully aware of this stuff but it doesn't stop her from making the decisions and and, and behaving in that way even though she says she acknowledges that it's not necessarily a good thing. It, it doesn't right. change her, her thought process. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, candidate Padillo starts criticizing the recent performance of the PRT uh, and Taylor suspects that the timing of this was staged. Yeah. Almost as if this whole plan centered around embarrassing the PRT. Mm -hmm. Because at this point, uh, Coyle enters flanked by Uber elite and circus. Oh no, not Uber and elite. <laughs> So yeah, Coyle in, engages uh, the mayor in dialogue and explains um, that the heroes and even the villains will be distracted by strategically set fires. Uh, here we also realize that Dinah is the mayor's niece. So Taylor almost killed Dinah's cousin and terrorized her uncle's family in order to save her. Way to go, Taylor. Yeah, it's, it's really small things like this that make me absolutely sure that you and I are not being too hard on Taylor. Um, we've got so many re moments of, of, of textual reinforcement to say that the almost killing of the mayor's son was absolutely unequivocally the wrong thing to do. And here's another one. Here's another handy one that's mm -hmm. saying, look, here's the choices you made. The rationale that you're making isn't quite as, as black and white as you, you thought it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Circus strikes down all the mayoral, mayoral candidates with a brace of kunai. Uh, Piggott, uh, Piggott, Jesus, Piggo. <laughs> They're going to make fun of you. Uh, I almost made it. I almost made it, Scott. <laughs> almost the whole thing. Uh, Piggo tries to stand up to Coil and uh, gets a knife for her trouble. When Circus throws another trio of knives to finish her off, the wards teleport in suddenly, uh, and they finally get a brief moment of being really cool. Weld saves Piggo. While Kidwin and Chariot batter down the, the mercenaries with stun weapons, Vista bends the room to shield the people from the mercenaries, and Clockblocker uses a cloth to cover them. Um, after they take down the soldiers, Clockblocker tags out Chariot, double agent, and they tie him up. And all around, they just look like badasses. Yeah, I mentioned lately just how much I love the wards, because I absolutely love the wards. Mm -hmm. And stuff like this makes me imagine a scenario where Taylor had actually joined this team, and I really wish it had happened. Um, I, I love seeing everyone so effective and in place and kicking ass. It's so great. Unfortunately, it's also far too easy knowing what we know about Coil. Yep. Um, because the heroes commence a shootout with Uber and Leet, and Coil presses a button, which apparently activates a bomb that was planted in Kid Wynn's armor. The wards try to teleport the bomb up into the air so it will detonate away from people, but something goes wrong, and it detonates in the lobby where Coil is and seemingly tears him and many other people apart. Oh no, Coil's master plan went totally wrong, and he's dead now. I can't believe it happened that way. <laughs> Coil is defeated so easily. Oh well, I guess that's the end of this arc now. You know, I, I'm I'm not even sure if I like. It's funny because I think you you immediately were like, no, that that 
that doesn't work narratively and you just like didn't accept it. But I, I think the first time I read this, I was like, huh, what a, what a George R. R. Martin esque unexpected twist. Um, <laughs> so I just, I think I was just kind of thinking in different terms than you um, and probably a lot less deeply at the time. Yeah. So we, we go into 16.9 and Taylor wakes up blind and drifting in and out of consciousness. She verifies that her dad is alive uh, and then starts feeling around with her bugs because she can't look around. Um, the front part of the building is destroyed and there are charred bodies everywhere. Yeah, Matt, when I said that Taylor probably didn't even need her eyes anymore a, a few arcs ago, I was being facetious. Um, I did not actually expect it to happen. But here yeah. we are. Taylor is now effectively blind for the rest of this arc. Yep. Um, and yeah. Yeah. So against Lacey's protests, Taylor climbs over to the mayor and finds him bleeding out. She tries to staunch the bleeding and calls for help, but nobody is in much shape to provide any. She thinks to herself about how she doesn't buy for a minute that Coyle is actually dead, not with his power in play. Yeah, and I'm really glad we didn't play out this reveal for any longer than absolutely necessary. I think it does work, to your point, as a really end of the chapter. Wait, what? A uh, cliffhanger? And then mm-hmm. nothing more? Because if you if you really stop and think about it for a second, there's first of all no way that that Coyle would ever allow himself to be dead here. Not not just because his power wouldn't let it happen, because it would just be this completely unsatisfying narrative conclusion. And and I think by this point, I am fully aware that Wild Bo is, is much better than that. And and obviously, yes, you could do a George R. R. Martin subversion of this kind of trope, but it just didn't feel like that's where we were building to with this. So I'm glad we didn't play it out as this chapters long reveal or anything. Yeah, no, you're you're totally right there. Yeah, so as usual, Taylor is very calm even after this violent situation. She's mostly just angry about Coyle's waste of human life and uh, for putting her and her dad at risk. Yeah, and it really makes you wonder because we already have some pretty heavy hints that it's passengers that encourage this kind of aggressive behavior in capes. Um, at least that's what I've speculated. Um, I wonder if it also like affords them this level of calm in these pressure situations. And, and it makes you think, you know, with all of this, how much are we seeing here is Taylor's personality versus that pesky uh, passenger cape interference thing. And I think that's something we're going to be learning more about as the story goes on. At least that's my guess. Yeah. And, and I am glad that, that we're at, the, at a point where where you can you can have that thought uninfluenced by me, because like if you if you remember, like my in, in the first the very first arc, um, I, I commented, I was like, the one thing that kind of like took me out of the story was like how eager Taylor seemed to, to go get her hands dirty and how quickly she jumped into fighting with lung. Um, and that to me seems like, you know, connected to, to that whole thing that you just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's absolutely fair. And it makes me, you know, I, we're, we're not even, I think we just crossed the halfway mark of the story, at least, at least arc number wise but i'm already i'm already debating what a reread would reread would look like for me now um, which is kind of insane yeah 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 so while she impatiently waits to be medically assessed she tries to figure out what coil's plan was here it's interesting to watch her reverse engineer the situation uh, she considers that circus probably only killed the targets that coil wanted killed and then theatrically wounded the others and considers that uber and his power armor uh, might be a stand-in for Trainwreck, uh, the, 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 basically that the big metal suit served some specific purpose, uh, but she can't really piece it together. Yeah, it's so insightful in this moment, and she she turns out to be pretty correct on just about everything. She just doesn't know the, the why behind it all. Um, I, I love that the respect for Uber is so low at this point, that the, the, the situation of probably just a stand in for the other dude is like almost <laughs> immediately believable. Like there's no other logical reason why Coyle would recruit this person ever. And <laughs> poor, poor Uber. And <laughs> he feels so bad for these, these henchmen. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and she is, she is really, really close to kind of understanding it, but it's not like an unrealistic amount of deductions. It's like, you, you feel like you feel like yeah. she's smart in this moment, but you don't feel like, Oh, there's no way she could have put all this together. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so they cart her past the mutilated and dismembered bodies, uh, and they take her to the same hospital where she was treated after fighting Leviathan. And Matt, we called this out last week, and, and I think we're seeing it again here in this second half of the arc, where Taylor is revisiting these familiar places on her journey. Um, and, and we didn't even call it out specifically, but returning home 
is part of that as well. Um, and she's doing it now from a different perspective. I think this is very intentional and it serves as not only like a recap of the journey, but um, a, a good comparison point for how much Taylor has grown and changed so far. Uh, this arc ends with Taylor making this big fundamental choice that I think is going to change her forever. And we're, we're building to that moment with this kind of silent recap of the journey. And I think it's really cool. Yeah. I mean, this, this is really, I'm really glad you pointed this out because I wasn't aware of it. And, and now as I'm like flipping through the chapter in my, and through, through the arc in my head, I realize how, how right you are, even in very subtle ways. I hope that we can point this out as we go along because you, you're exactly right that this is like a, it's, it's, it's like symbolically reminding us subconsciously reminding us of, of how we got here. Yeah. Yeah. So Lisa shows up at the hospital to check on her. Uh, and she promises that they'll kidnap or otherwise find someone with healing powers to fix Taylor's blindness. <laughs> so that's where we're at now, Matt. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll just forcibly steal someone to handle your problem yeah. for you. Yeah. Oh, man. Thanks, Lisa. I mean, I, I, I like this as as just a beat of Lisa being super overprotective of Taylor. Yeah, like, yeah. Don't worry, we'll kidnap someone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, Lisa reassures her uh, that fewer people were killed than Taylor assumes. Um, we still don't know how many people were killed, but it's it's fewer than you think, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> and, and and that the fires set in her territory were intentionally superficial and haven't really damaged her territory. Also, she confirms that Coyle is alive and probably happy with how things went. Um, so there's no better time than right now to press him about Dinah. Yeah, and and we're again hitting this this beat of not all is as it seems. And I think th this works when combined with the fact that Taylor is blind, that she literally cannot see. But metaphorically, um, the blindness serves as her dealings with Coyle for the rest of this arc. Well, most of it. She's kind of blind to the truth. She's off kilter. She doesn't her senses are not are kind of betraying her here and she doesn't really know what to think or do. And he has her on the ropes and, and, and has all, seemingly all the advantages here. And I think that that works so well, like the blindness comes at this perfect time to, to just make this delicious metaphor. Yeah, you're right. Like if, if she had been blind during the slaughterhouse nine arc, it would have, you know, it would have hampered her obviously, but it wouldn't have had this thematic resonance that you're pointing out. Yeah. Yeah. So Taylor is forced to choose between waiting around for her dad to have an MRI and leaving him yet again, and she chooses to leave to go see to the Dinah situation. Yeah, and this is really, really important, um, because we hear, you know, this is the second time, we, we didn't talk about it, but there's a moment when uh, Taylor's sitting there pondering if she's sitting in the middle of a debate, and she knows Coyle's coming, and she's deciding, should I just reveal myself and stop him, or should I just stay here with my dad? And she says that to leave him in this moment has a real sense of finality to it. And then she repeats that again here in this moment when she's trying to make this decision um, that that she feels if she chooses Skitter over Taylor again here that her relationship with her father, um, which is, again, let's remember the only real Taylor part of her left now. Uh, but this relationship will be irreparably damaged. It'll be gone. Um, that will be it forever. And I think importantly, there's no context for this feeling of finality outside of Taylor's own mind. Um, this is just something she thinks her father doesn't really indicate this will be the case. No one is externally telling her this, but Taylor thinks this will be the truth and then makes the choice to do it anyway. And right. that's so huge. Yeah, like like she sort of imbues it with with reality by by thinking that it's so. Yeah, and um, and, and like in a few chapters, like we're going to see Taylor make that huge decision um, and, and and do something that she can never take back. And that's so important. And we'll get to that when we when we get to it. But I really do think that it is here in this moment where she chooses Skitter for Taylor for the final time, or at least in her mind, what is the final time that the groundwork for that choice is is fully laid out um, that that in this moment, Taylor is dead and and she is just Skitter now. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it's so well timed. I think it. it, it happening in this moment and not that big choice that we're going to get to is just such effective storytelling because it allows you to build up the tension to that moment where it seems real and plausible because you have this set up here. It's just, it's just really good. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So as they make their way out of the building, Lisa comments on how Taylor will now be forced to learn how to process her bug senses even more efficiently. So time for her to finally level up again. 
Yep. I, I like how uh, Lisa says, like, uh, it, it's funny it, uh, that, you know, you're going you're gonna to be in this situation. And Taylor's response is like, it's not actually that funny. Um, <laughs> yeah, which, please remember that I'm blind right now. Yeah. Well, it's also just a moment of me thinking it like made me think like, you know, I really love Taylor, but I don't really like her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, because she has no sense of humor in, in any yeah. of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. So they get in the car uh, with Lisa driving, luckily for now. Uh, and Lisa mentions that they'll have to find Coyle because he's effectively retiring his supervillain identity. She plays a news recording for Taylor by way of, ex- of explaining the situation. Uh, so the spin on the situation is that Kid Wynn's tech malfunctioned and exploded, leading to casualties. So basically the wards are coming out of this looking terrible, even though they were actually great. Uh, Pigo is, is being put on leave. And Thomas Calvert, who we, who we met recently, is taking over. And apparently he uh, got an honorable discharge from the PRT, uh, which uh, suggests that he smoothed things over pretty well after the whole shooting his captain in the back thing. Yeah, and this, Matt, is where I'm forced to admit that the, the hint that I had last week was that I did think that Thomas Calvert was being set up to be Coil. And I felt this like almost immediately after we were introduced to him, because just I think just the way he was described, the way he talked, his um, his lust for superpowers, his really low sense of morality, um, the fact that he had soldier training. So it was kind of believable. He had these super well trained mercenaries with him. It all just seemed to fit so much. And unfortunately, I was doubting myself and didn't pull the trigger on that. Um, I thought uh, part of me thought this is so obvious that maybe I'm just reading way too much into this. So um, I I didn't commit to it when I should have. I'm sorry. I think everyone probably guessed what I meant, though, um, because I was kind of I was kind of trying to admit it without admitting it. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I could convey the the G chat session where like you, you were reading and, and you were you know you were tweeting and you were also G chatting to me, and you were like, hey man, I, I think you know th- this is this is pretty suspicious. Like it was as you were reading it, you were like you pointed out all these things, and I just <laughs> pretended not to be there because I couldn't think of a damn thing to say. I was like I was like oh my god oh my god he's this is unbelievable, and I just like. I was like, if I just leave and then come back later and start a different conversation, then I won't have to think of anything to say here. You shouldn't tell me Um, that you do this, because now every time you don't respond to something that I say, I'm going to start reading into it. But see, now that I've realized that, I've actually just stopped responding to a lot of your conjectures. Oh, well, thanks. I appreciate that. (laughs) Yeah, this is... uh... It's a complicated web that we weave here. Yeah, you guys get to see a little bit of the uh, the inside baseball here for yeah. the conversations we have as we're prepping for this podcast. Yeah, it's uh, it's not easy. So we move into sixteen dot ten. Yeah, and Matt, I before we get into this chapter in the detail of the chapter, I just want to say that this is a mastercraft in suspense here um, because this is kind of our culmination of everything that Taylor has been working for. It's right here, and it's 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 now. And as much as I think you and I know what was going to happen we we don't know exactly how it's going to happen so we're riding this line with taylor and we're like reading into every word that that uh, calvert says we're questioning every move we're like just like trying to figure out what's going to happen when is it going to go down when's the the, the shoe going to drop and and while both starts at this level of tension and just carries it through and even even elevates it from there it's just oh, it's so good yeah no i i love it like this is not that the last chapter wasn't already tense, but but this is where it just gets on the roller coaster and it doesn't let up until the end of the arc. Yep. Uh, yeah. So Taylor visits Coyle's base, uh, and it's been completely cleared out. All the soldiers and much of the equipment is gone. The travelers are there though, and she tries to talk to them and invite them to go with the undersiders to talk to Coyle, but she's largely met with hostility and stonewalling from Trickster. Although Trickster does seem to have a mistaken sense of how on the same page his teammates are. Yeah, and, and, and like we were talking about, there's so much tension between Taylor and the, the travelers like immediately here. And, it, and it, this is this is our establishing tension for the arc. We're setting the bar here um, and we, we don't really fully understand why there's all this tension. Um, it it seemed like it, in the moment, my thought was. Well, we've been building for a confrontation between these two groups, and it's going to happen at the end of this chapter. So we're establishing and refreshing our mind of this now. Um, that's not what we get. Uh, this arc, at least not in this arc. I, I don't know if it's going to happen in the future, 
but it, this does do a really important job of of refreshing and setting up that splintering of the travelers that occurs in in uh, chapter 13 i think it is um mm-hmm. we're, we're hitting that beat one last time to make sure everyone remembers uh, exactly what the situation with the group is so we remember and it's believable when the splintering happens um but man like this is right off the bat this tension between these two groups and trickster kind of just being a total dick again but not an unreasonable dick you kind of understand him yeah. a little bit yeah yeah the trickster is always is always fun to pay attention to um yeah so uh, genesis uh s- sort of apologizes for trickster after the other travelers leave explaining that he's tense because too much depends on what happens in the near future. Um, and then Genesis says that she hopes she never has to see Skitter again. <laughs> I, I love that moment a lot. I think there's a lot you could read into stuff here. Um, because again, that I, that thing swirling in the back of my head is that I still don't really know what the second thing that the travelers care about. Um, but whatever it is, seemingly once they get it, um, they're going to leave Brockton Bay and don't plan on ever coming back. So still still don't know what that is, but I hope we get it soon. Yeah, me too. Uh, Taylor muses a bit about the travelers and decides that she's going to interpret Trickster's behavior as being just what it seems like it is, basically just hostility because he doesn't like her very much uh, and not interpreting it as a sign that he's being deceptive in some way. Um, She also thinks, again, about how she's not sure that she brings as much value to Coil as Dinah does. Yeah, that's uh, uh, because because she doesn't. (laughs) Um, and this got me, this, this took me down a path uh, again, um, because throughout this book, we've seen that Taylor constantly devalues herself as a human being. You know, she, I'm just Taylor. I suck. I'm not pretty. I'm not good. But Skitter is completely different. As Skitter, Taylor seems to have this almost unending level of confidence um, that sometimes almost borders on arrogance, um, that she thinks she's go so good at, at getting around these problems and solving these problems that it gets her in trouble. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing with this whole idea that she could make herself more valuable than Dinah, that seeing the the skitter arrogant side of her. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. I mean, this is the girl who, who went up against Mannequin and then later defended it as, as like, oh, he's he's not all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So yeah, she she meets with the undersiders on a rooftop, Scott. <laughs> rooftop. <laughs> I'm waving my cursor over this. Um, Coil is going to come and meet them all there. Uh, so they discuss the possibility of having to fight Coil. And Skater shows how she can make bungee lines so they can all jump off the roof if need be um, and probably end up okay. Uh, but generally speaking, Coil knows the team's capabilities very well and will have planned for them if he means to attack them. Yeah. So like you said, we're on a roof again. That's our, our full circle nature of it. Um, and and the, again, so much tension here, so much suspense. There, we're just we're just building and building it. And like our characters don't really have a plan. Like Taylor's plan is, I think I judged the length of this cord long as long <laughs> enough or, or short enough, but I don't know. So like we're in the situation where they don't they don't have a good plan. They they could be getting screwed. And we're just building this and built. And I love like the the villainish nature of this being on a rooftop of an unfinished building is just so perfect. Like, it's just so like yeah. the classic, like, of course, this is where you're going to meet Coil. Of course, this is where that showdown is going to be. So it's just like you're you just feel this build to that moment. Yeah. Like for me, this is the moment where it starts to become particularly cinematic because I can totally see the elevator coming up and Coil, you know, Calvert stepping out in his in his PRT outfit now and and the undersiders arrayed in front of him on the on the rooftop flanking their leader, Skitter. Um, Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, yeah. So in, in, in this moment, at first, he's pretending not to be Coil. Uh, but drops this pretty quickly after the mercenaries back off to give them some space. I love that beat, though, because like, (laughs) um, I think it's it's Regent, right? Who just calls him coil, like say, hey, boss, we know it's you or something. And he's really annoyed because he's trying to put up this this false thing. And like he has these mercenaries around him like it's everyone, like even his mercenaries know. But he's so into theatrics. He's so into this this part that he's playing that he's immediately annoyed and won't reveal himself until they're truly alone. And it's a really good beat. I like it. Me too. So yeah, in in this moment he explains what the plan was with the, um, 
with the debate. So most of the reporters were teleported uh, out using a tinker-made copy of Trickster's Power, along with himself, Uber, Leet, and Circus, who are in fact uh, standing right there on the rooftop with them out of costume. Um, although Taylor can't really see them. Um, she knows they're there, though. Uh, the mayor and the other candidates were strategically wounded, but, but will survive. And uh, in an inter interesting beat here, we learn that circus is uh, genderqueer, I, I believe is the correct terms. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, and, and they appear masculine out of costume while, while we're, we're more accustomed to circus being feminine in costume. Yeah, I like this beat a lot. Um, because again, just like kind of Flechette's uh, homosexuality, this isn't a plot point. Like, it doesn't matter to the plot. It's just stated as a fact, and you can accept it or not. Um, it's not like Wild Bo is using this, is manipulating this to tell a story or do something with it, um, or, 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 like, he's not using this as, as ammunition for anything, mm -hmm. and not abusing or manipulating it to his own ends. It's just, this is who Circus is, and that's just that's just that and yeah. i think it's i think it's a good way of um add representation to your story without abusing or manipulating it like that yeah yeah uh yeah so he further elaborates that the prt will now root out but sadly fail to capture the travelers and then very gradually defeat the undersiders uh leading the undersiders to be forced out of the city and then the undersiders will move into other cities where they will prepare the groundwork for the valiant director Calvert. And the thing I love about this plan of his is that it requires a lot of acceptance on the, the part of the undersiders um, to do this. Like none of their agreement was ever um, we're going to let you take back the territories that we've taken. We're going to leave the city and move to somewhere else. That's not what they signed up for. And there's quite a few of them that I think would not do this. I don't think Taylor would be okay with this. Um, had, had she thought that this plan would go past this point anyway, yeah. but it's just, it's just kind of like how casual he is in revealing that to him. Like he's, it, it's, it's good to show how confident he is in this moment that he's, he in his mind has won. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can go through each of the undersiders and be like, no, they wouldn't be up for it. No, they wouldn't be up for it. Yeah. I mean, but it's also possible that he's just lying here. Um, yeah, that's very true. Because he, he did start the preparation for for killing Skitter well before this. We found out later. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I, I mean, may, maybe he still intends to use the rest of the undersiders and but not Skitter. I don't know. Yeah. So so finally, uh, Skitter brings up Dinah. Uh, and after one rote attempt to dissuade her, he concedes and immediately asks for details on how to turn her over. And then I think this is this is a, a good um, lesson in suspense and tension that eventually you have to release it at least a little bit or it just becomes almost monotone. Like you get so into constantly tense that the tension itself loses effect. And so that's what I think we're doing here. Like we're giving our characters a brief breath um we we realize that wait like this is not going to be the place of conflict it's not going to happen here um it, it is only a temporary sigh of relief kind of but it is one we let our slack out just a little bit but it's we're still pretty tense and we still ride that line and i think it's very well done yeah it, it shifts into a different kind of tension which which is which is, I think, the trick for maintaining tension. You, I think you can maintain a high level of tension throughout a whole you know, two-hour movie, but the trick is you have to continually be shifting the kind of tension it is. Otherwise, otherwise it kind of, like you said, you just, you just kind of get bored of it almost. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. fair. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, he arranges for them to get Dinah, uh, but asks Tattletail to stay and answer some questions about the Traveler situation. So the team splits up with Regent and Shatterbird staying with Tattletail. And Rachel, Imp, and Gru going with Skitter to free Dinah. This is like in a horror movie where they're like, <laughs> we should split up. And you're just like, no, that's a terrible idea. Um, and, and I love this because we, we know what's coming. Like, we've seen now that we're divided our team and we can kind of see what, what, what this is going to end up as. But man, yeah. <laughs> in this moment, yeah. you're like yelling at the screen. Yeah. Yeah. So the team ride their mounts following Coyle's man to the safe house where Dinah is being kept. 
and and like you said you're you're so you're kind of expecting this trap the whole time um so skitter asks her if she wants to go home and dinah takes her hand uh, dinah seems healthy but not lively uh, and it probably pays at this point to read her demeanor in context of the fact that she can see the freaking future and almost certainly knew this was going to happen and also knows the dynamics of the next few hours almost certainly right right uh, and and we we build and we build and we build to this and it's it's so funny to think about this that we you can realize this after the fact but in the moment you're just like Dinah's acting weird and like even even in the moment where she grabs her hand there's this there's this tension at least when you're almost like wait a minute what is this is this really going to happen? Is like, is she really going to get Dinah? Like is the thing that I thought was going to happen for chapters, not actually happening. And it's just like this, the, you're, you're so thrown off kilter here. Yeah, no, I distinctly remember like at that part, at that point when, when she takes Dinah's hand, just like having that, like that release of tension in my chest of like, ah, oh, finally. And, and then of course the next thing that happens, uh, they step outside, the truck starts up, the high beams turn on, and Taylor finds herself teleported into a room full of containment foam and men with guns. Yep, and there it is. And there it is. And this is like this is almost Wild Bo doing what we thought he was gonna do the entire time, but <laughs> still subverting it a little bit. Yeah. Because because we build and we build and we build and then we release. And then we hold that release for just a little bit longer than we normally would. And it it allows this quick moment of doubt to creep in, and then we turn the page, and then we do it, and it yeah. just makes it all the more effective. It's it's so fantastically done. Yeah, this is one of the best moments I think to like study for for craft actually. Yeah, um, and and it and it ends with no monologue. I asked, you're not going to explain how you did it. You're not going to deal with my teammates. Um, how 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 you're going to deal with my teammates or explain what happened to me. He answered with the pull of a trigger. And that, Matt, is how you do a cliffhanger. Yeah. And now we're going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. Hey, folks, Bob here again, owner and operator of Fugly Bob's, the number one burger spot in all of Brockton Bay. Technically, th the only burger spot in Brockton Bay, but semantics. On account of the entire boardwalk being destroyed by that pesky endbringer, we've been forced to relocate. You can now find our store inside the absolutely beautiful, destroyed rotting remnants of Weymouth Shopping Center. I know what you're thinking. Isn't that merchant-controlled territory? No! Yes, but beggars can't be choosers. So come on down to Fugly Bob's and order the Rat Burger Special. At least three bites of real rat in every burger. Oh my god, they made me cook burgers for them all day and they never pay me anything and they threaten to kill me every day. Please, oh god, help me, oh god. Fugly Bobs. Look for our stand in Weymouth Shopping Center, right next to the corpse pile and directly across from the Hollister. Inviolable brand bomb shelters are the top of the line tinkerbuilt solution to your constant sense of mortal dread. Our shelters protect against explosions, electromagnetic pulses, heat, chronometric distortion, sonic blasts, psionic fields, vacuum, water, fire, radiation, plague, acid, lasers up to 50 megawatts, spatial distortion, and poison gas. Inviolable bomb shelters. An immovable object fit for an unstoppable force. And we're back with uh, chapter 16.z, the Marquis interlude. Uh, Marquis holds court in the birdcage. He's been sheltering Amy for some time, but he's burning up political capital doing so. People are starting to think he's soft. He's exposed a weakness, and it seems clear that this is a weakness. Amy doesn't want to use her power, and Marquis is willing to give up everything to protect her. Heartbreak, thy name is interlude. Because yeah. it's like, I feel like we, 
Wild Bo toys with emotions in interludes more than anywhere else. And this is another one. And it's with Amy again, who, right. who continues to be one of my favorite characters in this story, even though we've kind of seen the end of her her arc, possibly. Um, it's just so God, every time we see her, I just am so sad. Yeah, I know. It's like your your heart was just healing and now she's back. Yeah. So Lung is there with him, just kind of hanging out, not not working for him, not subservient to him, just there. And Marquis muses how Lung's rise to power was due to aggressiveness and and raw power. Uh, and those qualities weren't n- enough to keep him on top. Uh, and, and, and in contrast, it's careful tactical management of image and loyalty that keeps Marquis on top. And that's uh, what he's risking by asking his people to protect somebody who offers nothing in return. Yeah, so I do have a, a few complaints regarding this interlude's location in the arc um, being right after this major cliffhanger. I think we'll touch on that at the end of it. But it is very clear to me here in this moment that these comparisons of leadership qualities are meant to directly contrast between Coyle and our Taylor conflict and where those are right now. And I think it's important that we last left Taylor. She had apparently lost. And I think we're supposed to see that the, the, the styles of Lung and Marquis comparing to Taylor and Coyle. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, yeah, you could get, go into that pretty deep if you wanted to. So yeah, his, his lieutenant, Cinderhands, is already questioning his judgment in holding court, but stalks off to arrange the meeting nonetheless. Marquis thinks it might be prudent to provoke a mutiny in his people just to see who he can, uh, who is uh, least loyal to him so that he can murder them. Now, he doesn't even consider that he might lose the fight, and later we see him relatively confident that he could beat even Lung. I wonder how much of this is, is like bravado um, um, or, or like overconfidence and how much is a fair sense of his abilities. He doesn't strike me as a type of person who would have a false bravado privately. Um, I, I would, I think very much he would project that kind of bravado publicly. Um, and there might be some falsehood behind it, but I think since we're just seeing in his head here, I, I really, I read this as just a very honest and fair appreciation for his own abilities and what he can do. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I just think it's, it's kind of shocking that he thinks that he could uh, he has so little doubt that he would that he would be able to do that. Yeah, especially from what we've seen of of Long and his power. Yeah. So he thinks of Amelia at this point as tabula rasa, uh, Jack's turn, ironically, ready to be filled with something else. Yeah, I love that you you specifically pointed out that this tied back to Jack because I actually didn't catch this, but you are absolutely right. And and in this moment, we know what Jack would have filled her with um, everything horrible and monstrous about her. But Marquis is not that person. Um, he is a bad guy, but it's his daughter and he genuinely cares for her. And he has this important sense of code to him. And in this moment, he doesn't know what to fill her with. <laughs> Or how he just knows that he's running out of time. Yeah. Yeah. He sends Amelia to go shower and he looks over his cell block uh, and it, it, it looks like he runs a pretty tight ship. His block is the only one remaining with all of its television still working. Yeah, I think this is a nice quick character beat to kind of show you the seriousness of Marquis's worry um, th- that we see that sticking out his neck is so unlike him because he runs this really tight ship and, and how much Amy's presence here has fundamentally changed his game. Yeah. Eyes eyes follow Amelia, though, as she goes to the showers and Marquis exerts his power, drawing an X across her path, a, a big visual no to everyone paying attention. Um, and we learn here that he experiences, quote, mind shattering pain when the bone that he's using uh, with his power breaks, um, because I guess it is his bone after all. Yeah, Jesus. I mean, <laughs> I thought Wolverine's complaint about his claws coming out hurts every time was a big deal. But this is so much more than that. Yeah. And, it, you know, speaking of capes, like not noticing the impact of their power, the implication of this is that there's just like shards of Marquis bone all over the cell block. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he even compares his own personal cell as like a lion's den when there's just stray pieces of bone like everywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's it. I love that. Yeah. So he invites Lung to attend the meeting of cell block leaders on the basis that Lung has a strong reputation and his presence there will make Marquis look confident. Um, 
And then Marquis selects a Dickens novel from the new shipment and sits down and pretends to read while thinking things through. So I, I know this might be a waste of time, but there's a lot of minor beats with this book delivery that I absolutely love. Um, first, the fact that Marquis, of course, picks a Dickens novel is so uh, telling because uh -huh. not only does it track with his opinion of himself as this higher class type of criminal, but uh, Dickensian type of stories are, or, or Dickensian type of people are ones that, uh, and, and I quote here from the definition, suggests the poor social conditions or comically repulsive characters. <laughs> um, and, and this is just so fitting to what we're doing right now. Like, it's just so wonderful and sly. Um, yeah. But there's there's another beat here that um, uh, I want to give all credit to uh, Twitter user user at Rosie Rach. Uh, Rachel uh, pointed this out to me as I was live tweeting that uh, there is a YA uh, romance novel featuring uh, love between a human and a ghost included in this bunch of books. And if you extrapolate this out, you know that uh, Dragon is the one sending these books over and that presumably Dragon reads all these books and then sends only her favorite uh, to the birdcage. So first, the idea that Dragon's reading a, a, a YA romance novel is just delightful to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then if we extrapolate it further, Dragon also knows who lives in each cell block and would probably... Uh, earmark certain books to go to certain people which means that dragon probably arranged for this particular ya romance novel to be delivered to amy because she thought that she would enjoy it and that is even more delightful um yeah. so thank you rachel for pointing that out that is wonderful and i that's headcanon for me now i fully i fully think that that's exactly what happened yeah well apparently dragon also makes portal uh portal references and lord of the rings references so yeah she, she's a nerd <laughs> yeah yeah, so uh, eventually Amelia comes back from the shower and Marquis coaches her on how to behave in the meeting um, and she repeats that she won't use her power. And it's clear at that point that Marquis doesn't even really know what her power entails other than that she's a healer. So eventually the 11 block leaders uh, with their 11 lieutenants arrive and we have Acid Math, Galvanate, Teacher, Lab Rat, Gavel, Lustrum, Black Kaze, uh, Glastig Uinye, Doing my best here, guys. String <laughs> Theory, Crane, and Ingenue. Um, and they're, they're the leaders. Hey, Matt, remember when we said we were going to play the name game with every new character? So take it away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there's... I, I think, I think uh, Scott, we may, we may get to know some of these characters more than, yeah, than, yeah. than this moment. Um, I, I don't think we need to, 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 to hew so closely to that rule for ourselves that we have to spend five minutes on each one of these names. I think you're absolutely right that there are some people in this that are probably going to matter uh, a lot. Um, I, one in particular is, is very transparent after the end of this whole interaction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, and, and a lot of these characters are, are very highly, you know, characterized from the gate. Uh, Lustrum, as soon as she starts speaking, she seems very strongly feminist. Uh, teacher also gets more of a description. He's he's fat, ugly, red faced balding. He, he doesn't look like a cape at all in Marquis's estimation. Um, and and I mean I think it's funny that he actually seems smug to have like figured out that panacea might imply that that Amy is a healer. Like like that was a mystery that he solved. Yeah, like that's not <laughs> a, <laughs> a very well known thing. Right. Like I think even Long would have the where for all to realize that. Yeah, possibly. Uh, yeah. Um, and so, yeah. And then then we move on. And, and I always admire well done power scale, relative power scale demonstrations. Um, and specifically here showing how all these uh, powerful monsters pay attention to and even defer to the batshit crazy fairy queen, Glass de Guigne. Um This is like the most effective one of these contrasts that we that we see. Yeah, you're absolutely right that Worm does do a really good job of efficiently expressing power and relative power. Um, what Worm likes to do is is mask the why of that a little bit and reveal it in really crazy, awesome ways. So we know uh, that Glastic is is powerful here, but not necessarily why. And, and I, yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, so so then she does go on to say a lot of crazy shit. Um, so what do you make of, of all of that business? OK, so it's pretty clear to me that the uh, fairies that she's referring to here are uh, what we've now come to call the passengers based on Bonesaw's description, um, that there lives one of these things inside 
every single cape and they're either sleeping or dormant or whatever word you want to use for this um per per uh, her knowledge they're going to wake up in 300 years and end everything or something um this actually leads into a speculation for the week that i have that i will save for the end of the podcast so now everyone's on the hook and has to keep listening um that's why we do it that way by the way um anyway <laughs> um we also get kind of information that the fairies seem to have unique personalities. She describes Marquises as an artist. So I think this further is kind of emphasizing that, that the personalities of these passengers might show how exactly powers are manifested. That changes exactly how powers do what. And also, I think, lends a little credence to the idea that uh, these passengers are affecting uh, our characters' emotions in some way. Um, mm-hmm. so that's what I got out of that. There's a whole lot more I'm sure that is, is set up for stuff. I, I wasn't able to see, but it, it's a very interesting, uh, couple of, of paragraphs. Cool. Yeah. So as you, as you said, uh, or, or, or kind of implied, uh, Glaster Guigne seems to be able to see both Marquis's and Amelia's powers and judges that she will treat Amelia as an equal, which is shocking to the gathered capes, um, I don't know if it's shocking to us because Panacea using her power all out was always a terrifying thought for me. Yeah. And it's almost, it's, it's an opposite of effect for us than it is for uh, the, the audience here, because Mm -hmm. it's almost as if we're realizing how powerful Glastic is because Uh we know how powerful Panacea is. And so we're getting confirmation of what we've already been told, which is everyone respects her because she has this immense level of power. Um, And it's, it's a really cool moment. I like it a lot. Yeah. That's interesting how that works differently. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Amelia then becomes highly distracted after touching Glastic Guinea's hand. And she admits that she could theoretically heal some toothaches, which is which is better than she was saying before. Uh, but she wants to make an exchange of information and asks why they can't break out of the birdcage, which is a really weird question at this point because she like just volunteered to be here. Yeah, almost as if she just like learned some really important information that she feels is so important that she needs to tell the world as quickly as possible. Yeah, or something. Some, I don't know. Something, Maybe some, I don't know. Something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? So, yeah, teacher uh, gives his answer to this question, which I don't know if we're even supposed to, like, take this at face value. But but his answer is that the birdcage is affected by size warping technology. Uh, and maybe the whole prison has been shrunk down to the size of a fist. And it's just this tiny thing buried in mountains and, and well sealed away. Yeah, that sounds really cool. I don't buy it. Um, <laughs> I think it's mostly bullshit. Um I, I, there's nothing in the the power or the tech of dragon that we've seen so far that leads me to believe that she would be able to do this. And I feel like she would be using it more often if that were so, but, uh, it is interesting at least. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, after the meeting, uh, Amelia asks Glastaguine, uh, and, uh, sorry, asks about her, um, and says that she could see the fairy queen carrying the fairies inside her and drawing on their power. Um, and also that she had three of them just there beside her, but but dormant. Um, and and Marquis says that she can have a handful active in doing what she wants, walking around at any given time. Yeah. So her power is to basically steal other people's passengers and use them. Um, that's really interesting. And, and I think we have seen this hinted at before. If I'm if I'm correct, uh, we know that after Bakuda died, um, that we were told that that Glastig resurrected her yeah. quote unquote to use her but it was a shell of her former self so obviously it was probably just the passenger to be used in some certain way that's really interesting stuff yeah and it kind of becomes obvious why that would you know be a scary power uh so yeah amelia thinks the fairies are sentient and she feels like she should tell someone what she has discovered but there's nobody here to tell um and then she feels guilty about the few mo- moments of reprieve from thinking about victoria that this distraction has offered her um, that she explains to Marquis that she doesn't want to lose the memory. And Marquis responds by taking her to the cell block tattoo artist. Yeah. And it's almost like this real, like hit you in the gut moment that mm-hmm. almost as if as soon as Amy is reminded of what she's been through, we are too, because I too got distracted by the excitement of all this information that we're learning um, and was really into it. And then I was like, Oh yeah, this is a girl who is, broken and damaged and suffering in these immeasurable ways um and she's still that way and and i i kind of love marquis here 
um like taking her to a tattoo artist like get a tattoo so you'll never forget about her um i think you can probably extrapolate out whether this is genuine concern or him just trying to handle her in a way that ensures their both both of their continued survival um realistically it's probably a little of both but he's very fatherly here and and i like it yeah i think that's that's really interesting because he's he's like clearly a sociopath on some level um but yes. but also like he he did he did raise her when she was a small child and and in his own thoughts he does seem to have like genuine concern for her um it, 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 there's a few specific points when he when he thinks about like how he feels fatherly concern it doesn't seem like it's it doesn't seem like he's just like adhering to his code in a kind of rigid way it's it's i think his his regard for her is authentic yeah absolutely i yeah. i completely agree yeah uh, so later on um she speaks out loud in her cell hoping the dragon will transcribe a message and send it to someone who can use it uh, dragon systems record and parse it and at that very moment the simurg changes the course of her flight high above the earth uh, the Simurg's movements scramble the message as it's transmitted and it falls through the cracks left by Defiance's imperfect tinkering with Dragon's Code. Ultimately, the message is archived without being flagged for further action. Yeah, it's almost as if that in this moment, uh, the Simurg moved in order to stop this message from being received. Um, almost as if the truth behind the passengers that Amy has figured out is something that the Endbringers themselves are trying to prevent from being discovered almost as if they work for the source of these powers, which <laughs> makes my head blow up. Um, it's a really cool moment, though. I like it a lot. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I mean, no, I just, I, I mean, like, it's, it's, you, you, you don't, you don't know what to make of it. I mean, and, and you're, I don't think you're supposed to know what to make of it, but it's, it's yeah. so, like, evocative and, and, like you said, kind of, kind of mind-blowing, and you're, you're like, what, is, what does this mean? What does this mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so before we moved on, I did just want to talk briefly about, you know, we have these bonus interludes that we get occasionally, and they're usually slotted at random points in the story. Um, a lot of times, though, th th their location in between chapters is really important because it's either setting something up that's going to happen. Um, I think the first one we saw was uh, Lisa's in in arc eight which was right in between the Endbringer fight and the stuff that we learn in there actually kind of matters um, for how we see Lisa later in the story. Um, but here I'm wondering if, if you think this is, this feels weird and out of place because this to me would have worked perfectly as an end of arc interlude, like just slotted at the end where they normally are. And it feels like we're just throwing this in between a cliffhanger to kind of stretch the cliffhanger out. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, I guess, you know, it's funny on, on rereads, like none of this bothers me at all because it, it just doesn't matter. Um, uh, <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I don't feel like it's being slotted in to stretch out the cliffhanger um, intentionally. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't quite know what to make of it in yeah. terms of like why, why it's why it's here why yeah of, like, like at the end. yeah i guess i guess that's a better way to frame the discussion is not could it work at the end rather why is it specifically here and i think at the end of the day is is this argument d almost doesn't matter because in any form after the thing is fully published like it is now like you're just going to read this and move on and it's like in any other book where sometimes like uh, George R. R. Martin does this a lot where a chapter ends on a cliffhanger and then we jump to another point of view and we don't catch up with that other character for, for chapters down the road and it doesn't really matter there. Um, so I think th that's the same thing here, but it just struck me as curious. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess we can think about this type of thing going forward. All right. Yeah. So we move into 16.11. Um, and I think it's impossible to discuss this chapter without explicitly framing it in terms of Coyle's power. Like, what is he trying to do with it and when? Yeah, and I think any confusion that anyone would have stemming from any of these remaining three chapters comes from losing that central grip on that conceit that you mentioned, that, that what is Coyle trying to do? When is he trying to do it? How is he doing it? Um, I, think it I think it comes off very clear. Um, I, these, I love these three chapters. We kind of move from here on out like the pace picks up dramatically and we're just going so much so that like when thinking back in my prep 
um, trying to remember what happens in 1611 versus 1612 versus 1613 is not really distinctive. They all kind of just blur together. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, I agree. Yeah, this is this is like one in, in that sequence of super tense, super propulsive, highly cinematic chapters. Yeah. And I think like you mentioned, um, it's a different kind of tension, though. It's not the same kind of tension we had in in leading up to what Coyle was going to do. It's just it's just kind of now what's going to happen. And it, it, it's instead of we're waiting for the bomb to go off, it's is there even a bomb? Like what, what happens now? And, um, it's, it, it's like, there's so much culmination happening here and we've referenced that before, but, but this particular chapter in, in specificity is Taylor emptying her toolbox and using mm-hmm. every single trip trick. She has every manipulation, everything that she has learned up until this point comes into play right here, right now. And it's God, it's really good, Matt. Yeah, and and I think you know not not to give it away, but her success here is very much earned. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so anyway, Taylor gets shot in the chest. That's that's the first thing that happens, um, and thinks that it's like gone through her body and that she's dead, which is kind of terrifying to us in that moment. Um, but in actuality, it's it's you know only uh, bruised her ribs really badly and, and knocked the wind out of her and knocked her down. I mean, it doesn't puncture her her spider silk costume. Um, so she she reflexively fights off Calvert and his troopers with the bugs in her costume, which is enough to drive them back and obscure their view of her. Um, so it's clear from the fact that Calvert keeps changing his orders on the fly that he's using his power in a rapid fire fashion, um, or at the very least, not in a rapid fire fashion, but both of his timelines must involve combating Skitter. So basically, he's putting himself at risk in both timelines here. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is you're absolutely right. And this is really important, but it's almost kind of comical. And maybe this is just because things have been tense for so long. I'm I'm grasping on to anything that could be perceived as funny. But he's kind of like, do this. Wait, no, just kidding. Don't do that. Do this. Wait, no, uh, just burn her alive. Go. And yeah. it's just like he he's changing midstream what he's doing and his and his plans. It's it's really good. Yeah, it, it's about as comical as it can be when you're trying to kill my protagonist. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the soldiers move in with Molotov cocktails, and Skidder makes them regret that by shooting one of them uh, with her pepper spray, which lights him on fire, and then tying the other one to his own makeshift bomb. We note that she can always hear now what Calvert is saying through her bugs, um, no matter where he is in or out of the building. Um, and we get the first of what will be a few moments where Calvert specifically orders them not to use grenades. Yeah, it's really great to remind yourself that Taylor is still blind here. And in this really tense situation, she's almost stumbled herself into doing what she's been trying to do forever, which is uh, the way to see and hear through her bugs uh, in a useful way. Yeah. And I I love that beat about the grenades, because, again, I think it's it's once again, you're seeing Coyle's power and you you can imagine the world where uh, a soldier threw a grenade at Taylor and she like netted it and threw it back at them and and blew them all up or something like you can imagine that the existence of that world. Yeah, I think you're almost prompted to. Yeah. Uh, So, yeah, Calvert tosses the bottle of gasoline to the floor on the other side of the room, um, correctly second guessing where she was anticipating it. Uh, and sacrificing one of his mercs to the flames, consequently. Then he shuts the door, uh, and, the, and the room rapidly fills with smoke and flame. So Skidder, as she's trapped in this room, she's aware of what the troopers are doing outside, even as she tries to escape from the room, and she knows that they're barricading the door. The windows are already boarded up, uh, and the house is isolated, and there are no other people nearby. And Calvert's soldiers have set up a chain-link fence around the whole property, just in case she gets out of the building. So uh, Skidder and or her passenger have been calling all the bugs in the area since the moment she arrived to her location. Uh, luckily, she feels about as trapped as it's possible to feel. So her range is probably pretty good. Yay for trauma, increasing power level. <laughs> Yay for never getting past the source of the trauma and just doubling down on it. Yay. <laughs> go, Taylor. Go, go. Uh, I'm no, being I'm being like, a little facetious, but in this moment, you are just rooting for her so much that like yeah. and any any moral questioning is kind of out the window at this point. You're just like, go, just go. Just go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This is one of the this is one of the most like pure scenes where she's just trying to survive against people who are trying to kill her. Like, there's, yeah. there's no, no questioning. 
Um, yeah, so unable to think of any way out of the room, she has some Black Widow spiders beat Calvert basically out of uh, bite Calvert basically out of spite. Um, <laughs> uh, but he doesn't really seem to mind too much. She just kind of like calmly crushes them, um, and she reasons that he probably already took the anti venoms. Um, side effects of Black Widow bites do include priapism, though, so you know consult your doctor. Um, and then and then he says burn it to the ground, uh, which she hears him say through the bugs. And then he just goes and sits sits, uh, sits in his car to watch. Yeah, and, and we talk about Coyle a lot as this very, he's the most standard, the most typical comic booky villain. Um, and, and I think it's almost easy to write him off here as such. I kind of did briefly, um, how he kind of just puts Skitter in this trap and then almost leaves to let it work out. But that's not really entirely true, is it? Because he's watching, but he's also presumably using his power constantly um trying to find the best situation trying to 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 see what works against her and what doesn't and we're kind of seeing coils uh universes versus taylor's toolboxes here and it's like almost they're playing chess against each other yeah i really like to think about what's happening right here where he goes and sits in the car because i can think of two possibilities like one is that he's like this is going south I am I am concerned for my life and that like in, in one in one reality, he just he just turns on that car and he drives away. And in the other one, he stays to watch because at least if if Skidder totally beats everyone and kills him there, at least he, at least he survives. And then in the other reality, he's like, um, you know, the, the, I mean, the, the other option is that his conservative choice was to go sit in the car and his aggressive choice is that he's like going around the battlefield, which implies that if that were the case, Coyle did die when he went up against Taylor. <laughs> right. And that's why he was, that's why he's just sitting in the car watching because he, he lost in his other timeline, even worse than he loses in this one. Yeah. And it's so crazy because I, and I think the most important part about this, and I think we're going to hit this beat again when we come to the later confrontation is because he's forced to use his power in this situation, it means that there's not a safe coil in a in a, a vault five miles down the road or something. Because yeah. he has to use it here, he's opened himself up to risk. And it's a very important that the, the the book takes the time to show us this, and it doesn't ever it doesn't ever declare it directly, you know, it's just hinted at because we see him subtle ways in which he's using his power, so we know, hey, this guy's out in the open. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Exactly. Yeah. So Skitter uses her gun to shoot through the planks covering the window and the soldiers outside answer this by shooting into the room from outside. Uh, but she senses this before it happens. So she's able to hit the deck. Uh, but she does take another bullet in the back in the course of this. It's fine. It's just more yeah. bullets. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's hard. You can't really make it any worse. So while she recovers and cowers, she has her cockroaches eat through the wiring and the trucks outside. Uh, and as the soldiers pelt the house with sustained gunfire, the cockroaches manage to kill the truck's headlights. In this new darkness, Skitter starts creating swarm clones and making them seem to drop from the window and run, drawing away increasingly more and more gunfire. Then she finally throws herself out the window, um, and the landing doesn't do any favors to her bruised ribs. Calvert is still in his car, not giving any orders. Um, yeah, and, and it, it was it was around here that I was wondering if he didn't just bail already in, in his other timeline. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, Skitter needs to get past the fence, uh, and she needs to distract the soldiers. So she does uh, the best thing ever, which is to have her swarm fly amongst them and to start saying terrifying things to them. Yeah, and I've kind of just let you go and, and talk about this because I, I want to interrupt this as little as possible because it's so good. I, I just think it's so... Like like I said, we're seeing every trick she has. We're seeing the nets to catch things. Um, we're seeing her clones. We're seeing her swarm voice. Like she's using every single one of these things to to escape from the situation, and it's just so good. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it, it, she's she's really really impressive here. So yeah, she she analyzed yeah, and 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 a, and a horror movie monster, yeah. Yeah, so she analyzes why Coyle fears the grenades, and then she ties the pin on one dude, uh, one dude's grenade, to the dude next to him. Uh, and then when this causes the pin to be pulled, the guy manages to hold down the safety lever. So she says she's going to do the same thing to two more grenades, um, and then he tosses the first grenade and runs, uh, and that grenade blows a hole in the fence, which is kind of what she wanted to happen. 
um, or what she caused to happen, actually. Uh, so the soldiers are pretty freaked out at this point, so they start backing off. Uh, however, unfortunately, she's she's still kind of like coughing uncontrollably, and she makes a small noise, which is heard by a soldier who starts searching for her. Uh, so th then Skidder pulls the pin on some random canister on this woman's belt uh, and just kind of hopes that it's not an incendiary grenade <laughs> that's just going to horribly kill the woman. Uh, yeah, but it turns out to be smoke, which uh, is very convenient for her. Yay, that's good. I'm glad we didn't just blow someone up. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a little premature. Uh, yeah, so Skidder really becomes, like, like we like we said, the horror movie monster here um, when she's especially when she she sneaks up on a guy and has her bugs say behind you uh and, and then he ignores the bugs and then but she really is behind him and then she pulls off his mask and takes him down um so it's just like that's such a cinematic little, little moment to me it's so good it's so good so she yeah, she steals the truck and drives away blind so now the blind 16 year old without a license is driving a car and this is the least insane thing that has happened recently in the story <laughs> yeah i love this part yeah. Um, yeah. So as we kind of wrap up uh, talking about this particular chapter and we kind of already hit on this, but like I, I know there, there have been some people who've kind of loudly said that it was unrealistic that Taylor would escape from Coyle's trap. Um, and the general thrust of those types of arguments seem to be that Coyle is unbeatable when he has preparation. Um, and I think that that thought implies some incorrect assumptions about Coyle's power and also about his character. So first of all, he only gets two branches at a time, and sometimes neither choice is going to be like an optimum solution because he can't always make his play like in one timeline I stay in my vault and the other one I do a dangerous mission because sometimes, like for example, this situation, there's a time constraint and and he, he needs to make something happen. Once Dinah is out of the pocket, um, he needs to get her back no matter what. So he's going to take risks in both branches, and there'll just be different levels of risk, and it can still go badly for him in both. And of course, he underestimated Skater like everyone does. Um, so even the less risky branch doesn't save him here. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think Coyle uses the fact that his power appears unbeatable to his advantage. Um, because, like even looking at, at Taylor and Lisa and how they were trying to, to come up with a way of taking him down. So much of their failure to move and act is because they perceive his power as this insurmountable thing. But I almost feel like Taylor's on the fly strategy and improvising here is almost the perfect counter to how Coyle's power works. And I think we'll actually see that Lisa's is basically the perfect counter to it. But more on that later. But um, this this like on the fly strategic thinking coupled with the limitations of, yes, you only have two options. Um, it, it it does show the weakness in Coyle's power. And it is, I agree, completely believable that she using everything in her toolbox could get out in this situation. And I think the, the important part is that the story takes the time to show us how difficult this was for her. She got shot twice. She inhaled a shit ton of smoke. She almost died like 60 times and barely got out. So it's not like this was easy. It's not like it was a walk in the park for her. It was probably the most challenging thing she's ever had to do so far. Yeah, this feels entirely earned to me. Um, I, yeah. I I don't really, I don't really buy a lot of, and not 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 to say a lot. Um, I think most people like this part. I, I'm just commenting that I've seen people who who find this to be like a stretch, and I'm like, uh, no, this to me was was entirely earned. Yeah. All right. So um, we move into sixteen dot twelve. Skitter is driving around looking for her teammates. And uh, she basically ends up triangulating them uh, when she finds Calvert's troops, which are shadowing them. Um, and she can't just like dive in and start picking off the squads, nor can she just let her team know that she's present because she doesn't know what countermeasures are in place. And she suspects that, you know, the squads might just immediately mortar her friends. Uh, so she kind of takes it slow and she investigates her team um, and finds them walking along. Uh, with a skitter body double holding Dinah's hand. Um, I just kind of, like, at this point, wanted to point out this repeated element of body doubles in this arc. We 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 saw a, a coil body double um, that actually may have been coil. I, I don't know. I'm not clear on that. Um, the, we have a skitter body do double. We're going to have a tattletale body double later. Is there... Do you think there's, like, anything thematic uh, that ties into this this particular arc here, or is it just kind of a... 
Coral likes using body doubles. Yeah, I really tried to to look into this for a while, and I couldn't pull anything out of it. Um, I, I think it is it is there is a three beat here. There's three doubles, um, but I don't know if it's trying to do anything thematically. Um, you could you could really try to re- if if she had to confront her skitter double a little more directly, you could read into the fact that this is a battle for the soul of Taylor. Um, but because that kind of confrontation is uh, avoided by her just kind of teleporting away in a bit, you can't really read that into it. Although I do still think we're having a bail, a battle for the, the soul of Taylor, but, um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to read too much into this. I think it's just a fun little part. Yeah. I, I at, at most, I was trying to sketch out something along the lines of like fakeness and, and duplicity, um, but yeah. I didn't get I didn't get real far on on that, so we'll just we'll let that go for now. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was I was thinking I, I like thinking about this moment here where Skitter alerts Dinah to her presence by flying a ladybug onto her hand because Dinah is obviously doing some crazy precog stuff here, uh, just to 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 make the inferences she's making. Um, like surely she knows the person holding her hand isn't Skitter because she's probably asking herself over and over like a bunch of questions like odds that I get to go home if X odds that I get to go home if Y. Um, and, and realizing what's going on as she kind of asks more. Um, and that's probably what's leading her to make obscure hand gestures, too. She's like, odds that Skitter gets this if I do this. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. It's this really great moment between these two characters who um, have never actually had any interaction, which is something I didn't really re- realize until I thought about it, that as much as Taylor's life has revolved around Dinah, they've never really interacted with each other. Um, and I kind of like that this almost inverts things where now Dinah is helping Skitter. Um, it's a very minor inversion, but I, I, I enjoy it. Yeah. I, I, I had that same thought the first time I read, I, I distinctly remember being like, ah, now, now the, the roles are reversed. Um, yeah. So Dinah signals her, you know, bas- basically signaling her like, like now, um, and Skitter starts running, still suffering badly from smoke inhalation. She attacks all three of the surrounding mortar squads simultaneously as she comes into range. And as this happens, Skitter loses control of her bugs very abruptly. And they all start receiving a crude override signal to congregate and attack. Uh, And she can tell that the signal is emanating from a box on the roof of a nearby building. Uh, Faux Skitter grabs Dinah and shoots Rachel. And Dinah has time to signal uh basically spell out s o r r uh before being teleported away with folks Skitter. oh man yeah and I, and I think right here like the most gutting moment is is where rachel is reacting to this betrayal and she says find her she shouted find skitter hurt kill yeah this is like there's there's such there's so much this level of hopelessness in this moment as you realize that like almost that Skitter has been outplayed again. And I was so worried here. We we had talked previously about how we thought that Rachel like literally could not take one more betrayal from Taylor. And I really thought that that's what we were going to see here, that, um, that, that where they were going to play this out. And now the Taylor Rachel thing was just lost forever. Um, I think this shows just how much I care about Rachel, um, how much we've seen her transform over this, that, uh, that, even though I knew this wasn't really Taylor that did this to Rachel, it was. And I felt for her like I was so imp- empathetic with her in that moment. Um, and it's just such a cruel game to play on these people. Like, it's really awful. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's 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 gut wrenching, like I said, you yeah. uh, know. So, yeah, Skitter barely evades the dogs um, and makes to makes it to the swarm box. But she collapses in a coughing fit, uh, and then she's caught and laid out by Imp. And she's also kind of understandably very upset, uh, uh, Imp is, by this betrayal. Um, And then Brian arrives, and he seems very detached, uh, which is somehow worse than either of the girls' responses to this. Yeah, I love that we get to see, again, it's another beat of characterization, right? Where we get to see how each individual person deals with this betrayal. We get Rachel's, we get imps, uh, call back to her warning about screwing them over again. And then we get Brian's cold detached reaction, almost as if he kind of expected this, or at least isn't surprised. Um, I think, and this might be me reading too much into things here, but I think this is a good echo of the moment in Danny's house 
where he didn't react to the mention of Taylor's mom's death. And Taylor perceived that lack of surprise as a dig against her. And I think maybe Taylor's perceiving that again here. Um, but maybe maybe it could be more complicated than that maybe it's not that Brian isn't surprised. Maybe it's just on some level he never really bought it. Um, I don't know. And I don't think the text ever really, really concludes on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that reading. I have a slightly different one, uh, which is which is basically more like he's so like lost and, and like kind of his like the only thing that he has at this point in time to like give him some normalcy is is Taylor and the time they spend together and, and like the opportunity to like have someone with him to sleep and, and, and that kind of thing. And the idea that he's like now he's lost this is 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 like it's too much for him to take and he's just like now now i'm back to having nothing basically and i don't know that's i I really love that this character is so fleshed out that i think we can have like like obviously contradictory but equally plausible explanations for why he's behaving this way yeah i I think i like yours more no Um. (laughs) (laughs) i I mean i i find yours entirely like plausible and and mine if anything is less supported by the text i just that's just kind of where i jump to for some reason um but yeah it's i I love i love brian yeah so but she does and and yeah like this is such a i just want to like dwell for a moment on how hopeless and horrible this moment is yeah because you you like you love all these people really and and something horrible could have happened here you know you, you could have had you know taylor killed you could have had any number of terrible outcomes from this um, but yeah, she does manage to communicate to Brian to use his power on her. Uh, and when he does, he sees that the swarm box, uh, is, is actually originating this, this source of, uh, of the signal. Um, and he realizes that, that Taylor didn't do this. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I think, I think the fact that she's coughing and can't form words, like only increases this, this feeling of hopelessness here mm-hmm. because like, it's just like, it, it, it's it's a, a an established reason for why she can't just explain herself and she can't just spit it out. And it just increases yeah. the tension. Cause you're just like, just tell him Taylor, like just tell him. And she's like trying to, but she's coughing. Um, I am kind of really glad that we didn't draw this misunderstanding out into like an arc long Taylor versus undersiders conflict. Like you could very much see it going there, but I'm just very thankful. We did not do that. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, and the only way you could do that is if you somehow made it so that Taylor couldn't just like explain herself to them. Right, because every right. like all these characters are like they're not rational per se, but they're also not stupid. And and, yeah. and she could have she could have explained it, and, and she did, and she did. Yeah. Um. All right. So then we, having kind of broken that that particular flavor of tension, we move on into sixteen, thought thirteen. Uh, Imp and Rachel don't seem 100% convinced that Skidder didn't actually betray them, uh, but they get over it all pretty quickly, which, especially in Rachel's case, I see as a pretty strong like I- indication that her, her character, um, uh, th- that like th- this team has built up a lot of trust. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, one of Rachel's big like trigger events to use to use the phrase is betrayal that it's just something she cannot stand and she will not tolerate so the fact that she's able to process through this and and believe taylor in this moment is huge yeah yeah totally i i I, this is um this is a great character moment here because it's, it's i don't know if it's the first time but it's one of the first times that we've seen her just just accept but like just trust someone basically yeah so yeah, the team concludes that Tattletail and Regent are probably already captives. Uh, they know Calvert will have planned out every contingency uh, and that they can't succeed in, in a direct attack. So they decide on a bluff, uh, which they pretty much have to because Calvert will know by now that the real skitter made it to her team uh, and chased off the fake skitter and the soldiers. So Gru calls Calvert and tells him that they caught up with and killed skitter and sends a faked picture of her body. So after some <laughs> somewhat comical jockeying with hanging up on each other, <laughs> uh, the, the two of them arrange on on a meeting uh, on the north end of the market. Man, I love that jockeying because, 
like first of all we see brian almost take charge here again like they're trying to figure out what to do and brian just decides that he's going to call him and he's just going to wing it almost and it kind of works but then there's that you're you're absolutely right that weird comical jockeying and it's like it's almost to me meant to say like this is kind of Gru's last struggle as leader of undersiders and it's kind of settling this once and for all that taylor is the leader that she this is this is where she shines and that grew is trying to do these things but kind of failing without taylor's help yeah i agree yeah um so 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 they end up making another fake skitter there's a lot of fake skitters in this chapter uh they make a another fake skitter out of a tragically murdered raccoon (laughs) and and parts of a mannequin um and they dress it up uh with part of her costume Uh, And they let Bentley carry this grizzly thing around in its mouth. Uh, So Calvert shows up at the meeting place with a small squad, uh, but relatively quickly into their uh, conversation, uh, he he lets on that he knows it's a ruse. And then he instantly teleports in way more of his mercenaries, plus all of the travelers and chariot circus, Uber and Leet. Yeah. And and I think here the important beat to hit is that, I don't think it's too outlandish to think that Coyle used his power here to, to determine if it was a ruse or not, because, again, I think this is important because it establishes that he is present here in both realities. There is not a version of Coyle that is in a safe house somewhere um, that he can merely cut back to as things go. Things don't go his way. He is out in the open. He is off guard. And that is so important for the events that that happen here. Yeah, and, and it's very credible for him to think that he completely has the upper, upper hand here and that he's in no danger because he's, yeah. he's surround he's like got a hundred times more people and and a ton of capes and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, so she she manages to get Coyle engaged in dialogue, uh, rather than just shooting them immediately by telling him that she's set up a dead man switch that will reveal his identity if Skitter doesn't uh check in. Um and he kind of segues eventually into actually arguing that his plan is genuinely for the greater good. Yeah. And I wonder if he actually believes it. And I'm inclined to think that he is, because I think that's showing that there are a lot of similarities between Coil and Terror in, in their belief structures, at least, and how they rationalize certain behavior. Um, and I think that's important here as they finally come face to face. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure like what the order of it is here, but like he he gets really angry when when Rachel is is telling him like that he's a liar and that he's not trustworthy because like yeah. he, it's it is true that he like has pride and like sees himself as if not the good guy like like serving a good purpose. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think it is very interesting that this whole uh, a dead man switch ploy of Taylor's, which is as far as we know entirely made up. Um, because yeah. there there would have literally been no time for her to set this up this way, um, but it does put Charlotte at direct risk, um, because she's basically just revealed where this person is and said that they have information critical to Coyle's identity, and she's kind of just put her poor henchman in 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 harm's way here, and I think this calls back to Sierra's kind of objection for working for Taylor and how. Um, working for a criminal, even if you're not doing crime, might not be the best thing. And that seems to at least agree with it. Yeah, right. It's, it's funny. I, I don't actually know if, she's, if she was making this up or not, but she does actually end up putting Charlotte at risk regardless. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, she, in exchange for deactivating the dead man switch, she makes a series of requests, um, most of which are actually like reasonable um and many of which seem like things that coil would do anyway and and in fact says that that's the case um one of which though is to, is to bring tattletale to this location um which he kind of objects to and and then when he does it he brings a bottle a body double first yeah those are really good beats because it's like why would i have a body double of her and taylor's <laughs> like why wouldn't you like and and of course he he absolutely does because yeah. he probably i mean it it might be realistic to think that he has a body double of every single undersider out there somewhere just ready if he needs it um i i, I think that's pretty funny yeah but i um, i think the be here that's big that we learn out that they learn that the way coil found out about their plan was that he tortured one of them several weeks ago in a separate world for information and i was curious what your guess on who 
the tortured undersider was. Yeah, I, I, my guess after thinking it through was Brian. Um, <laughs> yeah. And 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 my uh, like my basic reasoning was like he's like most likely to crack. Actually, okay, you know what? I just realized after saying that that several weeks ago would have been before the slaughterhouse nine. Oh so yeah. Well, I, I I wrote that. I don't know if that was actually directly from the text or not. I I think it was. I think that's what he said. But anyway, yeah, that that because like it just seems it seems like exactly the exactly a worm thing to happen would be to take the guy who's already horribly traumatized and then torture him more. Yeah. Um. But if it was if it was before the nine, then that doesn't make sense. So yeah, I guess my guess is I don't know. I I'm I'm thrown off now. What What do you think? I still think it's Brian. I think Brian from every conceivable way it just seems like brian would be the best for this um i i think he would be too worried that tattletale would smoke it out i think we've seen how difficult it is to do anything with taylor um even if you have her trapped in a, a burning house surrounded by foam she can uh -huh. get out so right. handling that would be too difficult um i think regent didn't know enough or torture would not work enough on him uh to make that a, a worthy endeavor um imp i think the same thing i don't think rachel would respond to torture well at all so it just it just seems like he'd be the most obvious choice sadly because the poor guy has been through so much yeah right i think it kind of has to be um brian or 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 lisa and, and like you said it seems like lisa we kind of like figure it out ahead of time so yeah, yeah or at least the risk of that would be so great that it's not worth like if you're trying to say if you're looking at it from I need to know something. Here's five people, which would be the easiest and safest for me to get a hold of. Yeah. It seems like yeah. it would be Brian. Yeah, I think so. Um, and so the, there's an interesting moment here where um, we learn the detail that uh, Leet's power sabotages him, um, which we kind of knew. Um, th that's why they didn't just teleport Skitter onto a bomb or, or into a vat, of, a vat of acid. It kind of had to be like, specific circumstances had to had to be met for the teleportation to work yeah it's a, it's a really clever way of uh closing a a kind of plot hole um in a, in a narratively satisfying way and there's something here that brought me into a line of reasoning that i want to make a speculation on but again i will save that for a few minutes from now all right yeah so after after this moment where he's insulted by rachel uh he agrees to let uh the real tattletale appear um, and he reveals then that his plan is to keep Tattletail as a slave the way he treats Dinah. So he orders the mercenaries to, uh, after Tattletail appears, he orders the mercenaries to fire on the undersiders. Uh, and some do, but they're quickly stopped by their compatriots. Seems that Tattletail has bribed most of them over the course of, of recent weeks. Um, and through her personal relationships and management of their personalities, she has led them to betray Calvert. This is such a great moment, but I do have a question for you that maybe you know mm -hmm. something that I don't. Did Taylor know about this part of the plan? Um, because like there's a there's a moment here where as like Coyle's like counting down to fire that she is like desperate and like yelling at him like she says Coyle. She says Calvert like she's just, like desperately trying to get him to stop counting. So it like seems like at least on some level, Taylor didn't know the full scope of, of what Lisa was doing. Yeah, I I really don't know, um, and, and maybe we'll f find out. Like, I, I don't I don't know, I don't remember. Uh, maybe we'll we'll be refreshed on this, um, and we'll find out find out later. Because um, it because it's it's it does strike me as suspicious that she's really really insisting that Lisa be brought here, right, um, as if right. she, as if she knows that Lisa's going to implement this plan. Um, but but also it's it's credible that she just wants Lisa to be brought to verify that she's alive. Um, it's, it seems like Lisa, so, so I think I, I think I come down saying that like, she probably knows some things, but probably not everything. And I think it's for the exact reason that like, they know that their infosec isn't good against Coil. So Lisa is just going to tell people the minimum amount that she has to tell them to, to keep a lid on things. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. So, so after this little, little betrayal, um, Trickster isn't about to let this happen, uh, and and then he he's gonna try to stop it. But Skitter speaks out to Sundancer and Ballistic, and Ballistic like immediately defects, 
Uh, but Sundancer doesn't because she kind of feels trapped with the, with the travelers. Uh, before Calvert can make any more overtures to Trickster, though, Imp tasers Trickster and Sundancer, and then Ballistic pulverizes the Genesis projection. Uh, and th that's all highly satisfying because Trickster mocked Imp for being useless a few chapters ago. And she's like the most clutch player in this arc. Right. Like the, the Pigo capture feels like almost a lifetime ago now because so much stuff has happened between now and then. But Imp has again and again proven like fundamental to every single plan working. And like see, we're, we're really seeing how ridiculously powerful she is. It's, it's yeah. kind of cool. Right. I mean, she's, she's even the one who gets the drop on Taylor when when uh, when they're chasing her. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so Tattletale gets in her own monologue here, and this is probably where we see how damn powerful she really is. She has been undermining Coil's whole operation from the inside, ferreting out weaknesses, knowing what she could get away with, uh, knowing exactly what weak points to strike. And, and now Coil is here, having used up all the opportunities that his power allows him. Yeah, it, it, like we said, Tattletale is really the perfect counter to his power. Um, because she can play the long game in a way that he can't consider. Um, and she knows exactly what moves to make. And if those moves are too risky or not, she's just really perfect at countering him. And it's just really fabulous stuff. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, as as she approaches Coil in this moment, Taylor thinks over the continuum of choices that have led her to this moment letting Chubster die because she couldn't save him, letting Thomas die because she didn't care to, the deaths she couldn't prevent and the deaths of the nine that she tried to inflict, and the near murder of Triumph. You're not a killer, Calvert said. No, I replied. I couldn't see, so I screwed my eyes closed, I felt the moisture of tears threatening to spill forth. I took a deep breath. But I suppose in a roundabout way, you made me into one. I finished. I aimed the gun and fired. Matt, <laughs> so we're running late on this podcast already, but this we have to talk about this. We, I mean, yeah. it's just it's just so important. We have to spend the the right amount of time on this. Yeah. And and I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't really write down much notes here because I just really want to like go through this with you. Yeah. Um, the, the first thing I definitely wanted to point out that this is just shooting someone and then blaming the person you just murdered for making you a murderer is like the most Taylor thing ever. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's just so, it's just so this, this perfect fundamental Taylor moment, almost to the level of, I, I probably could have predicted that this is exactly how this <laughs> would have gone down if I had thought about it. Cause it's just so Taylor. Um, but then like more than that, we see like we see the speed very specifically where she's thinking about every bad thing that she's done, every bad choice that she's made that leads up to this moment. And that the reason that she did all those bad things was in her mind so that she could make this choice here. So, so she's justifying it by, by almost by saying that if she doesn't do this, then every bad thing that she's done up until this point, um, loses its justification so she's almost by, by positioning her argument with herself this way she's she's almost guaranteeing that she has to act here like that she's she's almost removed the option for the choice like this is a trolley problem that doesn't have a lever it's like this is the only thing she can do in this moment and she doesn't even have to make a choice it's just what she has to do yeah that's a really interesting angle there um and and, and definitely the the idea that there's there's no trolley problem here there's no i mean other than the idea of like well you don't if you don't kill coil here uh he could uh come come back and get you later it's yeah, like yeah that's yeah. that's true but like you're you're just i mean you're executing this guy and it's not even i, I want to take like him deserving it off the table as a like it's uh, it's to me to me i don't find it interesting like whether or not he deserves to be executed it, it's, i agree it, this is more about Taylor, um, the 16 year old girl who, who like rehearses this litany of like increasingly in her mind, uh, bad things she's done to get herself to this point where she's like, yeah, I, I am a killer. Um, and, and, and I'm going to do this now because I've decided to, it's, it's not even like I need to, it's like this, I'm choosing to do this here. Um, there's even the beat where, where Tattletail is like, you don't have to be the one to do it. 
And she's like, yeah, I do. Um, yeah, yeah. Because like and I, and I think that is very specifically because if she doesn't do this. Then every other bad thing she did no longer has that justification that she desperately needs. And mm-hmm. and I think that's so important to this decision here and, and it, how how bad it makes a decision. And and I think I I absolutely don't want to go down that road that that you mentioned of did Coyle deserve this? Did should Coyle have been been killed? That's that's immaterial. Like that the point is how Taylor justifies this, how Taylor comes to this point, how the person that wanted to be a superhero at the beginning has now executed a human being. Um, yeah. and, and what that says about her as a person. And like I, like I set up earlier, this, this fact that she has fully embraced Skitter has fully left behind Taylor is so essential to that because I don't think Taylor could have done this, but I think Skitter was always capable of this and it was just, letting herself fully become that person that allowed her to be able to do it yeah i i think i think that's that's right i mean we've talked we, we've used the, the word like culmination a number of times in this chapter in this arc because this is the culmination of like you said events that really started rolling in it like at the end of arc seven when she yeah. kind of learned of her cul- culpability in, in dinah's captivity um and essentially from that moment on she's been motivated by guilt um, like we, we liked in this podcast, we like to obliquely reference stories about protagonists who, who, who turn bad, um, which is a trope that is usually done poorly. Um, and this story does it so well, uh, that I think you can actually have a legitimate debate over whether this teenage girl shooting somebody in the brain actually qualifies as bad. <laughs> um, because the events that pushed her to this point are so extreme and her reactions have been so human and and believable if not like if not right at least you can empathize with her um that you can actually still be on her side at this point and i think that's really incredible yeah and and look you're being too hard on taylor squad i <laughs> I, I am on taylor's side here i like i empathize with her and i understand what she's going through and i want to see her through this and yes, this is this is a, a watershed moment in in her life, and I am so terrified of what comes next, what comes after this. I, I do think that there is there is some fundamental thing with taking a person's life that changes you in yeah. in in a measurable way, and I think that that even even if we go down the route of saying this was completely totally justified, she made the right decision here, even if we say that, um, we still have to deal with the consequences of what that does to a person. And I think the story almost explicitly says that by showing how we cliffhanger this arc, because yeah. we almost immediately are like, oh, look, here's the consequences of your choice. And I think we'll get into that into a bit, but just how this is maneuvered, how this plays out is so fantastically done. Like, I can't I, I can't imagine this playing out in a better way. Of course, it had to come to this moment. Of course, it had to be him in this fully surrendered moment. Of course, it had to be her doing this at this time. Like, it's just it just yeah. feels like this is where everything was going up until this point. Yeah, I agree. And just to speak to your point about about like be like being on being on her side, but still kind of worrying about her. Like if if your friend if your friend had to shoot. And, and kill a home invader you wouldn't be like high five man yeah you'd be like you'd be like oh my god are you okay like yeah. like uh, i'm so sorry that, that you had to do that and and that's like that's the that's that's kind of the humane approach to this especially when taylor is like the 16 year old girl um yeah 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 um yeah so yeah they, so that, they, that happened <laughs> they they drive away with rachel fiercely holding her hand Holy shit, Matt. <laughs> Holy shit. Um, I could talk about this for another 10 minutes if we wanted to, but I, I like this is one of those those moments where like as these pieces set into place, as it's Rachel that grabs her hand in, in your head, you're just like, of course, of course, yeah. it, this was going to be. Of course, it, it's not going to be Brian. Like, it doesn't make sense for the story for it to be Brian, because we've seen over and over again how their relationship is just this mess. Yeah. and. And it's it's Rachel 
the person who is never understood, who can never understand other people, it is that person who in this moment knows exactly what Taylor's going through. Yeah. And God, it's so wonderful. Like, it's so good. Like, I have goosebumps talking about this right now because yeah. I, I, I loved it so much. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I didn't even notice that, like, it's it's not Brian, that Brian is, is, like, nowhere to be seen in this exact moment. And that it's Rachel who, like, on the superficial level, Rachel can, like, read her body language and see that she's devastated, whereas other people yeah. not, might, might not be able to see that. But on, on the deeper level, it just shows Rachel's compassion for her. Which right. Is more well, important, and Rachel is one of the two people that we know is a murderer in the group. Right. Yeah. Um, it, Alec is the other one, but Alec is not going to comfort her in this moment. Alec has yeah. no has no emotional way of understanding what she's going through. He, his emotions don't work that way. So, I mean, it, 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 it of course, it always had to be Rachel. And yeah. I'm so glad that it was. Yeah, I think Alex Alex way of of offering um um, um solidarity was not making a quip at that moment. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. So, yeah, they everyone heads to Coil's base, which is now Tattletail's base, I guess. Um they free Dinah and Dinah gives Taylor a hug, which feels really good for everyone at that moment. Um but this happy moment is broken as Taylor notices something. And she runs to where Tattletail is, uh, who is standing in front of Noelle's vault, which is smashed open and her warren is empty. And Tattletail says, let me answer your question with another question. Tattletail said, you think we could convince the PRT to turn on the air raid sirens? Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> this, like, like we already hinted at, this is just the perfect way to end this arc. Um, we had Taylor make this fundamental choice. Um, she has become Skitter, and Skitter has become a murderer. And it, to to not try to lampshade this at all, uh, Wild Bo, in this moment, tells us actions have consequences. Here it is. And you've got your positive consequence. Dinah is free. We're happy. And then you have your negative consequence. Noelle is free. Fucking air raid sirens. And mm -hmm. that that is that is the most clear demonstration of you did this, you made this choice. Look what happens now. And and again, sometimes we can't see those consequences until it's too late. Um, we we had no idea that like and I don't even know exactly how it works out when Coyle did this, how like I guess he realized that he had lost. So he just tapped into her intercom. So they heard. So so uh, Noel heard that they that they killed him and thus supposedly preventing her from ever getting cured. I'm not sure the I exact uh, uh, details behind it, but the point is that I think we're supposed to see very directly that because they beat Coil and because Taylor executed Coil, this is, this is what happens now. Yeah. All right. That was, uh, that was great. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that's a rough ending. Yeah. All right, Scott. Let's uh, let's move on to your speculations because that's I know I know people are looking forward to that. Yeah. So first, I have to sadly uh, give myself credit for saying that Taylor is going to murder someone. Um, when I originally made this speculation, I really thought it was going to be a member of of the Slaughterhouse Nine. Although I did say that I think she will eventually use that Slaughterhouse Nine murder as justification to kill Coil after he failed to let Dinah go. Um, I got that a little off. But uh, he, she did murder Coil, so um, yeah. that part was correct. So yeah, and I'm, even though you didn't formally make the prediction that Calvert was Coil, I'm gonna just mention that here. And okay, I, th I think I think I think people are gonna give you credit for that, regardless. Okay, I certainly do. Well, thanks, thank you. Um, so my new ones, the ones that I've been uh, teasing throughout the episode, um, the first one is that we learned about how the passengers are going to wake up in 300 years and end the world, basically. So my prediction here is that the uh, Jack Slash end of world event that everyone is talking about will somehow in involve finding a method to wake the passengers up early, which will trigger a premature end of the world. Um, I don't know exactly how that'll work, whether it will be uh, him encouraging Bonesaw with her exploration of what the passengers are whatever um but that's that's my guess for that one 
Okay. Um, cool. Number two is that the passengers, though dormant, uh, do communicate to each other in some way. And this one, I'm really reaching on this one. Um, but the passengers as, as a whole do not want Taylor to die. So this is my roundabout way of explaining exactly why Leet's passenger refused to teleport Taylor into any kind of instant death scenario where she was just screwed. Um, this, the only reason I, I came to this conclusion is because there's this really weird beat when they're talking about Leet's power and how it malfunctions. And Taylor specifically mentions that his it must be something with his passenger. And I just thought that that really jumped out of me is like why she would mention that thing specifically in that moment. Um, so that's where that came from. Okay. Awesome. So those are my two for this week. I don't have any more, um, but I'm anxious to see what I got right. So that's Scott's yeah. speculations for this episode. Yeah. Exciting. Exciting. All right. Uh, well, that wraps up our coverage of arc 16 Monarch. I hope everyone enjoyed our discussion and hearing Scott's reactions. As always, we appreciate your feedback, and we're always trying to improve, so let us know if you have any advice, questions, or thoughts on this week's episode. You can reach us via email at gotwormpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at gotwormpod, where you can also see my weekly live tweets of my reading of each new section. Um, my personal Twitter is at scottdaily85, that's D-A-L-Y, and Matt's is at mordinamale. That's right. That's right, Scott. Uh, if you've not already subscribed to We've Got Worm, we strongly recommend you do so and never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else in the world that you can listen to podcasts. And as always, you can find this, all the other podcasts we do, and all of our writing essays, film and TV criticism, and more at dailyplanetfilms.com. And just yesterday, we published a new episode of the Daily Planet podcast in which me and my co-host, Michael, uh, talk about some summer movies. So uh, you can check that out on the Daily Planet podcast feed as well. That's right. Uh, we also have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash Daily Planet Films. Again, D-A-L-Y. If you like what we do here and want to help make sure we keep doing more, consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. Uh, no new producers this week, but producer... Eli did up his donation amount recently. Thanks, Eli. Um, now is a great time to become a patron because we're just wrapping up our first We've Got Worm fan art contest, and only patrons will be eligible to pick the fan art that wins the contest. Um, and also only patrons will be eligible to win the raffle for a copy of the winning print. Yeah, that's, that's a very exciting time right now. I'm really excited about some of the entries we've gotten, some great artwork. Um, also, on top of that, we are a mere $9 away from hitting our next Patreon goal, which involves Matt and I uh, launching the Daily Planet Book Club. This is a monthly live stream discussion of a book voted on by our patrons. Um, we will do our usual type of in-depth analysis, along with some uh, question and answers and discussions brought about by you guys. Um, you can attend that uh, live in person with us. And there's I, I think we're going to go through YouTube. We're not sure exactly how we're going to stream that yet. Um, but you guys can, can log in and, and, uh, discuss along with us. Um, and then I think we're also going to upload those, um, to the daily planet films podcast feed as well. So if you can't attend live, you can at least listen to it after the fact, but, um, we've already started asking some of you guys for some book recommendations. I think what we're going to do is going to get five or six of them, uh, toss a vote up on the Patreon page after we hit the goal and have you guys vote on which book you want to cover first. Um, so if you if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, if that's uh, something you think would be fun and, you, and you're not already a patron, consider just throwing a few bucks our way and, and getting us over that that final hump and make that book club happen. I'm very excited about that. Yeah, me too. Uh, we, we did a couple of books. We did Fates and Furies um, and Wool in the past uh, in kind of uh, phase one of the book club. And, and that was really fun. And so I'm really looking forward to starting this back up, doing doing a, a reboot and um it's gonna be good yeah absolutely so uh, yeah and of course while you're over there at patreon.com please make sure that you stop by wildo's page and uh, toss some money in his direction because he is the guy that makes this whole thing possible yep and uh as always if you're one of those that can't spare any extra cash we do completely understand 
But as always, there are tons of ways to still help us out. You can share a podcast on all your various social medias. Um, you can just continually at famous people on Twitter until they either block you <laughs> or listen to the podcast. Uh, just, just kidding about that last part. Kind of. Um, <laughs> but... If you do listen on iTunes, if you could please, please, please take a quick second and rate and review us. It really, really does help. Be like this week's spotlight reviewer who is named hashtag free canary, which is <laughs> a great name. Uh, hashtag free canary gives us five stars and says worm is approximately one point six eight million words in its entirety. This podcast is fantastic is a fantastic delve into the story arc by arc. Worm is a highly addicting story, and I would guess that most readers, listeners, rushed through it on their first read. This podcast offers a way for such readers to take a step back and appreciate the obvious and subtle moments of brilliance in Worm. Scott and Matt are just so good at getting these moments in commentary and commenting with delightful insight. A first-time reader would benefit from listening to this podcast along with the reading, and I wish I had known it was available during my first th read-through. An added bonus of this podcast is the occasional questions and comments made by Wildbow through Reddit. I love this. Um, I think he's commenting on my <laughs> propensity to say that over and over again. Um, but that was a, a wonderful review. I feel pretty good about myself right now. <laughs> How about you, Matt? Oh, yeah, me too. I'm... Uh, I'm constantly uh, amazed and and flattered and uh just really happy that uh that we've gotten the response that we have with this and and that uh we're, we're able to do this um, yeah it's it's like the most fun part of my week so. it, me too man i look forward to this every week i mean so much of my week is taken over by worm and i love every minute of it yeah me too yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, that's it for us this week. Um, I guess I'll just mention again, uh, the Bayesian conspiracy podcast. If, if you're interested in hearing my voice drone on a bit longer, um, look over there and, and that episode should be up, I think sometime this week. Um, next week we finally get to cover, uh, one whole arc in one week when we jump into arc 17 migration. So Scott, judging by the arc title, what do you think this one's going to be about? Well, with Noel on the loose, I think it's about time we get that long hinted at conflict between the travelers and the undersiders, um, which perhaps leads to the travelers migrating from Brockton Bay. Huh? Huh? Hmm. Huh? Well, find out next week on We've Got Worm. We've Got Worm.